Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 27th meeting of the Economy Committee. Um, due to ongoing COVID-19 safeguarding measures, some members will be attending tomorrow, uh, this morning's meeting via video conference, and our witnesses will also attend via video conference. The meeting will be broadcast live, and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. Um, just to remind members to mute their topics by pressing F4 on their device. Um, so, uh, item number one then, apologies. We have apologies from <coughs> Stuart Dixon due to continuing illness, and I don't think we're aware of any other apologies. Support, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, then moving on to our draft minutes, um, I will refer members to the minutes at page five of your pack and a record of decisions at page three of your table papers. Um, our members content that those are an accurate reflection. Great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on then to item number three, um, Chairperson's Business. I just wanted to, to highlight that um, there has been no further announcements around business support um, from the, the underspend in, in the grants. Um, I had a, a brief conversation with the Minister on Monday about it. Um, and um, just to reiterate that there are, are a lot of contacts still being received from um, constituents by, by members. Um, and that you know a lot of people are under real pressure. So hopefully we will hear something soon about that. But if we, we don't hear it in the next week or so, we would like to hear from the, mem from the minister before recess. Um, and also the the British Chancellor is making a, a mini budget announcement today. Um, so I think it might be useful to get a breakdown of what is actually new money from the department, not repurposed money from, from previously, in terms of, I think there's announcements around skills package and also around um, green energy and retrofitting um, expected. So it would be useful to get a breakdown of those. Thank you. Um, moving on then to, to item number four, um, our oral briefing from Invest NI, um, which we will be receiving via Starleaf. Um, and it's in regard to the uh, COVID-19 response. So there is a clerk's memo at page 11 of your pack. There is a briefing paper from Invest NI at page 14, and there's a presentation at page 8 of your table papers. So I'd like to welcome and bring into the spotlight um, Kevin Holland from Chief Executive of Invest NI, Donald Durkin, who's the Executive Director of Strategy at Invest NI, and Dermot McLean, who's Head of Economic Strategy at DFE. Um, so can everybody hear us okay? I think we've only, we've only got Kevin has been running the spotlight. If we can also have... Donal and Dermot. Oh, there we go. Great, thank you. Can you all hear us okay? Yes, morning. Good morning. Thank you. Um, so just, um, sorry, I think there is there's a presentation at Table Papers, which, which has um, 23... Uh, slides. The committee um, understands and appreciates the, the work that Invest has been doing over the past while. Um, and if you maybe want to go through those slides um, with a, a light touch approach to the first, um, up until we get into the COVID-19 response, if that's, that would be okay. Yeah, I'm happy, happy to do that, Chair. Thank you. Do you want to go ahead then? Uh, should I go ahead? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So listen. Uh, good. Good morning. Thank you for the chance to um to um spend some time with you this morning. I will be brief on the presentation. I have got a stop clock in front of me with a big fat button on it, so I'll make sure I don't uh, kind of eat up into question time. Um, but I did want to put some context into the COVID recovery plans based on some of the things that we do already, uh, and I'll kind of light touch the presentation, just picking a few slides. Uh, from slide three, the main thing I wanted to comment is that um, you know we, we do use five key areas to help drive the economy, looking at how we can grow jobs and salaries. Uh, innovation, I think, is really important, ever more important in the COVID world, uh, and then particularly how you can use entrepreneurship to capture the value of innovation when you've got new ideas. Uh, then for me, the, the, the things that we can do with exports, and we'll look at some of the numbers uh, are really important in terms of bringing money into uh, to Northern Ireland uh, and then the investments that we place ourselves, that um, domestic companies place and then the foreign companies place 
are all very powerful contributors to um, to economic development. Uh, so I do have a team spread across the world, both in um, the regions across Northern Ireland uh, and then in the various locations you see on slide four. But I would say that you, know, you obviously have many groups who work with you in the economy committee. You know, we do have a team overseas. We are very focused on the 7 billion people who don't live here and the 65 trillion pound economy out there uh, and looking at ways we can help bring some of that economic activity uh, home into Northern Ireland. Slide five, I won't comment. I just right left it there because we often get into discussions around kind of wider business and then high growth clients. We do have very strong programs for both groups. I would say the left-hand side for wider business, what do we do for the, the wide base in Northern Ireland has been growing, um, but we do focus still on some of the companies who will export and who will do international activities uh, on the right-hand side. Uh, slide six then, um, I would say the kind of performance so far has been pretty good. And uh, with the money we get from the government, every pound generates some um, six pounds of investment uh, over a three, that's the results over the last three years. So I think quite a powerful amplifier of funding that we do use. Sales have grown in the top right-hand corner and then in the bottom left-hand side, this, this kind of focused target group where we really have the best data, uh, we've grown by about 28% to 130,000 employment into those high growth companies over the last um, six years. Uh, and the reason we use a lot of the data for those companies is they cover 75% of the sales that Northern Ireland makes outside of the, the Northern Ireland area. Uh, and that's clearly the kind of sales that brings uh, economic uh, uh, bonus back to, um, to Northern Ireland itself. So I wanted to put that as um, a short overview to start with. Uh, next section, just a few words on the outcomes, and you'll have seen this before in the committee. But on slide eight, those are the three main measures we publish. Uh, we published a few weeks ago our uh, results for the first three years of our four-year plan. It's around jobs, it's around uh, research and development, although results come later in the year, uh, and then around, um, around sales. Uh, slide nine, the top measure for me is, um, is jobs, and uh, over the the first, um, sorry, over last year, we, we introduced the 9,021 new jobs into Northern Ireland, and that brings the cumulative total to 29,113 over the three years. So we were very much on track for hitting the four-year plan before um, COVID came to, um, to join us and interrupt with that. For the sales, I'd like to focus not on the, the performance results here, but on slide 10. Uh, and the reason I bring this in is because, you know, I think it's very important to see how much of our companies are operating outside of uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, and we can see that last year we had um, sales of 17 billion pounds outside of the Northern Ireland territory. For me, I know it's in fine print on the slide, but the, the really interesting thing is that we were able to help our businesses grow in every one of the countries which are picked out in this area. So whether it's GB or ROI or rest of Europe or um, Americas or APAC, all of those territories grew last year. And I think the skills that experienced companies have done to grow that are gonna be really important as we go into COVID recovery. Uh, on slide 11, I'd also highlight it's not a one-off because there is a continuous seven years in a row where the companies we deal with have been able to, um, to grow. So I think the external sales have been very powerful. On slide 12, I wanted to comment a word on investment, although it's not on the things we publish. Uh, last year was quite powerful for Northern Ireland. Um, so in spite of many discussions on no deal Brexit in October, we did have a record year bringing 28 new investors into, uh, into Northern Ireland. Uh, the growth over prior year, and that will bring 1,400 jobs directly into the economy in those companies over the next um, few years, but then will also create a lot of econ economic activity across the rest of Northern Ireland. Uh, and you'll recognize perhaps some of these names, AFLAC, Contrast um, Security. But I think the, the bottom bullet point is the interesting one for me. I mean, Sensei, they, they're coming as a foreign investor, but they will create jobs right across the, the region of Northern Ireland given the business model that they brought in. And I think what we've seen recently in the COVID recovery that's going on with many of us working from home, the kind of model that does that with 
jobs across the region is going to become more prevalent. I wanted to then kind of wrap up that section just on um, slide 13. Uh, we, you know, we often get asked around, you know, who do we work for? What's the balance in the mix of what we do? Uh, so for last year's results, you know, 91% of the offers we made were to SMEs, uh, not to large companies. 55% uh, of the jobs were outside Belfast, not within the Belfast region. Uh, three quarters of the offers we made were outside Belfast. Uh, and then between international companies and domestic, we often get asked, what is the mix of, of businesses? 83% of the support we did was to local companies. So clearly for me in 2019, there was quite a strong focus on SMEs, on domestic businesses, uh, and on job creation and uh, activities across the region. We also were able to do a lot of work with wider business and um, gave helpline support to around the 10,000 businesses last year, which is pretty powerful. If I come on to um, COVID then uh, on slide 15, uh, there's four, four things on here I wanted to comment. Um, the first thing, the first two on the left-hand side are really around ourselves. And, you know, we are a large employer. We do employ 650 people. What we did do as a priority is also is protect our own staff. We have a duty of care to them. So we were able to move all of our team home within two or three days of the local government announcements. For us, the first one was in China in January. So we started lockdown middle of January with some of our team. But what I would say in the second priority we had, which is around making sure that we still keep functioning and that we're still using government money well, is that um, we were able to get all of our team up and running within two or three days with full access to IT systems, finance systems. So we were still able to pay suppliers. We were still, still able to assure our own business continuity and continuity to customers. Uh, so I thought that was a, a very powerful response. Uh, and I know some private companies and some uh, government or government related departments were challenged by that. But at least from our side, we were able to deliver um, continuity as well as safety for our staff. Uh, but then the interesting things, I think, for the committee are on the right-hand side, and the two other priorities we had were on the right-hand side, number four, was just making sure that businesses uh, and people have got access to good information. There was a lot of information being shared around health measures and how to protect yourselves. We invested a lot and took charge in you know, how can we make sure that, um, uh, that um, businesses get the right um, access to business information. So we run NI Business Info, uh, which is um, a website where we put together all sources of support for businesses. And we don't really mind whether it's NI funded or UK funded or funded from elsewhere, but we wanted to put all that information into one place. We also ran a series of helplines. Um, so we've had you know, some really quite um, distressing calls, particularly in the beginning of COVID from businesses who didn't know what to do. I do have a trained team who are online from their homes being able to answer those kind of questions and direct businesses for where to go. We also were able to adapt our business model. So normally we run lots of seminars and bring wider businesses together to help them learn around cash flow, business planning, logistics, and things like that. Um, I think in, 20, in 1920, we did around 2,000 of the people in rooms type of training for that. In, um, in the COVID period, we were able to expand that by putting everything online and having around four and a half thousand people join webinars to get the same content. So actually through COVID, we've gone much broader and making those kind of information accessible to a lot of people because you can now play on demand as well as join the seminar on the day. Uh, the, the third priority, which is the, the middle one there and the key one is really what do we do with businesses to help them survive and help them manage this situation? And we were both engaged in the emergency work as well as in the um, recovery work starting after that. Uh, I'll come on to PPE and hardship funds, but I did want to highlight that you know, we, we were very engaged with businesses, helping them deal with their problems. Uh, and we were also very active in trying to build the kind of body of business evidence that you need to be able to make the right business decisions afterwards. So we did do 1800 hours of intensive interviews with businesses, which we shared with the department, we shared with the councils, we shared with all of the business organizations across Northern Ireland, you know, how can businesses respond to COVID? 
Uh, and then the final bottom point there is we did change our business model by surrendering funds and then bidding for new funds to address the COVID challenges. Uh, on slide 16, we did really a lot of work in helping the healthcare system find the protective um, products it needed to be able to keep um, healthcare workers safe. First part of that was really working with businesses to do PPE, to change, reconfigure their manufacturing. You know, we had a 450 businesses who wanted to do that. We were actively in the middle of that. We also, through our team in China, were able to do the physical work of um, supplier selection and how do you get products out of China to bring products from China to Northern Ireland for healthcare work. And I think through that, I've certainly seen that uh, business resilience is a key strength here. For slide 17, then we were also, I, I think I called it voluntasked, you know, part volunteer, part asked to do this uh, micro business hardship fund. And really that was very challenging product project, which we delivered very quickly. Um, we were able now to, I think within two weeks, two and a half weeks, we were able to build a portal, set up an eligibility tracker, um, collect applications. Uh, and now we've got a system where we've made nearly two and a half thousand payments uh, to businesses through that but maintaining a good standard of governance of uh, government money. So those are two of the more specific examples of things we did um, during the COVID period. Uh, so, so what do we do next in the future? And um, we, we certainly spent a lot of time on slide 19, taking this business information, trying to understand what the future of business will look like um, in the light of work we'd already done for the industrial strategy. Uh, and then feeding into the recovery plans that the Department for the Economy was putting together, as well as our businesses. Uh, and the main, the main things that we were suggesting to do were on slide 20. Uh, and these are things which we're doing already with some of the funding we have, but also have been bidding for funding as part of the recovery packages. Uh, clearly, safe working is the number one priority, getting businesses back to work. Digital, I think, is really interesting because it brings market closer, it helps businesses operate more effectively. Uh, so we've been very active in that. I think supply chain is very interesting because a lot of companies have seen supply chains fragment during COVID. There are opportunities for Northern Ireland companies as that gets um, rebuilt. And we've got some proposals for that. Uh, growth and competitiveness, I think is interesting. You know, how can we rebuild a Northern Ireland economy and help companies be better after than they were before. And that's work at a company by company level, I think that's uh, very interesting. Uh, and then on the right hand side, this kind of grand challenge, big innovations, you know, how do we try and focus on sectors that will survive and thrive in this um, new post COVID, new global normal environment, and then how can we um, help them do that. So we've certainly been starting to look at that. And I recognize there's still a, a lot of work to do. Uh, slide 21, I won't go in detail, but I would just say that um, I'm actually quite optimistic about foreign investment. And I know there's COVID challenges and Brexit challenges and you know, domestic national policy in many countries, but I do think we've got a strong pipeline. And if we keep working with companies, uh, then I think they will still come here. Uh, and then slide 22, kind of overall priorities we have now is uh, first, uh, mainly moving from emergency to recovery uh, we're looking at how can you return to work safely. We've got checklists, we've got some expertise we can provide. The reset bit is very much looking at how do we help businesses operate in this kind of new normal. Uh, and then the third part in terms of kind of rebound, you know, we'd really like to help businesses deal with the kind of opportunities there are. And really, I think if we can move quickly, if Northern Ireland demonstrates the resilience it's shown in the last three months, and we can move the quick way you can for a region of 1.8 million, then I think we have some opportunities we can take that will help bring us out of this kind of deep hole uh, that um, COVID has put us into. Uh, that's what I wanted to, to share to, um, to start off with. And um, thanks for listening to that. And I'm happy to take any questions, um, Chair. Thank you, Kevin. That, that has been really useful. Um, I think all of us recognize the, the huge impact COVID has had um, and that businesses now are, are looking towards the, the future and how they, they can rebuild and refocus. I think we all also recognise the need for a real inclusive, regional balanced and jobs-led recovery, one that's 
I guess, bear and, you know, takes advantage of the, the digital um, strengths that we have, but also builds on the, the green economy. And I think, you know, there's a couple of things I would like to explore with you maybe in a wee bit more detail. That balance there that you have kind of outlined in relation of supporting some, um, our SMEs while also looking at the, the kind of opportunities that there, there may be in terms of um, inward investment and also in terms of um, looking at how local companies can take advantage of supply chain opportunities um, and how we can help support um, you know local companies um, you know to create shorter supply chains um, and to, to really strengthen our, our, our local um, supply in that way and, and across the island as well in terms of the, um, the, the opportunities that are there so maybe just to pick up on those things first of all Okay, so let me comment on the um, supply chains, actually, and I, and I think it's very interesting. And some of the work that's been done for the PPE is quite a good example of what happens when you can kind of work together um, um, with the companies in Northern Ireland. I think there's been great examples in the past in a sector basis, like in aerospace, where we've seen companies sometimes competing, but often collaborating to provide a strong offering. Uh, if you look at the um, PPE for Northern Ireland over the last three months, then you know, 450 companies volunteered to do something, um, but you've got to have more than individual will. You've got to have some collective coordination to bring something out of that. Uh, and I think you know, within my team, we've got um, supply chain experts, technical experts, people who can help you look at specifications and take that goodwill and convert it into millions of face masks, millions of scrubs, sensitive, complicated components for ventilators that are needed. So I think that work has been very instructive. I know the UK is also um, doing that at a central level as well now. Um, but what we've been able to do is work with Middle East Antrim um, in a system, bringing together the 11 councils, for example, putting together a kind of makers panel and then a buy, supply and I system where now companies in Northern Ireland can say what they've got to offer, describe it, and the local buyers who need these kind of domestic materials can hunt for it and see how they can source quickly, low cost, effective products locally. And I think that's quite a good, a good model for the future. Uh, Going ahead. No, I was going to talk about SME for a moment. So if you've got a comment on that, I'm yeah. happy to hear. No, so just in relation to that makers panel, is that specifically for PPE or is that being looked at as a model that could be rolled out further? Yeah, no, that, so the makers panel is a lot broader. I think the, the PPE has been like a test system that was set up into the buy supply and I panel for that system. But you know what, it doesn't need to stop there. You can actually do some other interesting things. Uh, and then as companies look at the problems they had through COVID with you know, supply chains are disrupted, I can't get what I normally buy from Taiwan, then I supply and I is a type of system where you know we, we can address that 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 needs with local supply in, in the future. So I think it's become quite an interesting um, tool to solve local supply chain problems. Um, and Kevin, um, the EU relaxed its state aid rules at the beginning of the crisis um, to help, for example, companies repurpose to, to um, make PPE. Is that something that um, you were able to take advantage of as well? Yeah, and so I mean, there are some state aid proposed. There are there are some proposals in our recovery bids which will make use of the more relaxed um, state aid environments to help companies make big steps forward. Um, but have they have they been able to do that so far? Is that something that has been able to be utilised? Uh, I was not really. I think the um, the kind of recovery bids that we've been awarded have been quite recent, and now we're going through the final approval steps to get those products, so those programs, up and launched in the next few weeks. Okay. Um, so, and you wanted to go on then to talk about SMEs. Yeah. So I was just going to say, um, kind of the SME balance, obviously, in the, in Northern Ireland has got a very strong um, SME culture, and you know, I'm kind of I'm very keen that we work, you know, with the kind of local economic development agencies and with small businesses to really build this kind of culture of entrepreneurship in Northern Ireland, because you know, I recognize there's real strength here. Um, for me, the, the big step that kind of SMEs make is you know, when you start looking internationally um, and you know, looking outside of Northern Ireland borders, 
it changes everything in a company when you start exporting, but it is, I think, very good for competitiveness, for productivity, for making sure you're looking at consumer markets outside the you know, kind of fairly small domestic market we have here. So we're quite keen to do that. Um, so we do work with um, big companies because they do found often the center of a cluster like cyber technology or fintech or aerospace. But around that, clearly, there's a lot of work we do with SMEs to feed into that um, big network. Uh, and then we, I think we've had some very nice examples of helping SMEs start to export for the first time. Last year, I think we had 120 uh, SMEs who exported to they exported for the first time, and then there's around 200 who entered a, a new market who were already exporting. And the, building those skills across the SME base is going to be really key if we want to you know, get out of COVID and, and also make the most of potential opportunities in the new free trade agreements um, with Europe and then with other places around the world. Um, and in the immediacy um, of supporting businesses through through the crisis, has there been an increased focus on the, those SMEs um, and how to reach them? Because I guess some of the feedback that we were getting, and particularly early on in the crisis, was that some of those micro and small businesses didn't really know where, where to turn for support. So has that been something that has been looked at? We've put a we put a lot of effort into um, communications um, to businesses, uh, and particularly as the crisis went on. I mean, I think it's true probably in the first couple of weeks of the crisis because it was you know human health first, save lives, protect people. Then we were probably quieter than we normally are in you know in kind of business engagement and making you know direct communications about business growth. It didn't seem appropriate. Uh, but then we really put a lot of effort and team and deployed staff into NI Business Info, as well as helping the executive office with the communications campaigns to outreach uh, uh, to broader businesses. Um, so we've also done, you know, we, we moved home so we're not physically visiting businesses uh, anymore, but we are very actively engaging with the, with the councils uh, and with the local economic development agencies to make sure that messages get to businesses uh, and we do encourage people to go to visit the site because it is a quite a good way of, uh, of finding what you may need. Uh, and we do encourage people to phone the helpline. If, if you don't know where to go, you know, we've got trained people on the end of a helpline open to any business who can, they won't be able to answer you. They may not be able to give you funding, but they can tell you where to go to help solve your problem. And in many cases, just talk it through with you, which was, you know, I think some of the kind of appeals we were getting early on. So when I, I think the engagement with SMEs is certainly moved up as we've gone through the, um, the, the, the emergency stage of the crisis. Okay, um, I'm going to come back in maybe later on and talk to you a wee bit more about the, the bits that were made during June monitoring for recovery, but um, I'm going to bring in yeah. Gordon first of all. Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much, Kevin, for your presentation. Um, you mentioned about your staff, and we would pass on our thanks to, to you and your staff for your help uh, with the businesses over the, this last three, four months. Um, the, uh, the website that was put, set up, I think, was very positive and very useful, and we got a, a lot of positive feedback about that. Uh, your staff, how many staff are on furlough, by the way? Or do you have any staff off on furlough? So we, we haven't furloughed anyone. We've got, we've got the whole team working every day uh, and active at home, access to all of our systems and engaging with clients, both in the UK and uh, overseas. So all staff, including overseas have been working throughout the pandemic, right? Good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And you said, did you say that, you, that you're not visiting businesses at the moment? Is that right? So we, it, when we, we, we moved to, um, if you can work at home, you should work from home. So we, we followed the guidance in the, in the beginning. Um, and then more recently, what we've done is we've um, set up mechanisms so that we can start visiting businesses where businesses have gone through a you know a health and safety assessment, which they do for their own employees to make sure that the you know as factories start again, their own employees work safely, uh, and then also they're safe to to welcome visitors. So we have started again. I was out in the you know Bambridge and Craig Avon last week and um, visiting some of the big medical companies there. It's actually quite nice to be back on the on the road again. To be honest, part of the recovery process. I suppose one of our big concerns is about. The loss of production. Um, we're, we're getting feedback, even like Bombardier, a huge employer nearby. Um, production there is not 
obviously anywhere near where it was. Um, and that will be the case in an awful lot of manufacturing businesses and in processes. The demand is not there. If the demand is not there, the work is not there. The work's not there. The workers will not be there. So I think what has been done to, um, I suppose, offer support to those businesses at an early stage, what we don't want to hear is bad news coming through on the radio uh, or through the media about people's jobs disappearing and little or no support being offered. So what is InvestNI doing proactively to offer support to businesses where there is a risk of... And there, will, there is that real risk now as, we, as people uh, come off furlough and return to work, there is a real risk that, we're, that there will be major job losses. And I think what is important here is to do what we can to sustain the businesses that exist. I think that should be a priority. What has been done to do that? Please. Yeah, thank you, Gordon. So um, we, we, we do a lot. And the first thing is, I mean, we, we engage with businesses really frequently and intensively. So, um, for example, you know, every day during the last 100 days, we've been sending the kind of furlough numbers, potential redundancy numbers, challenges business face, we send through to the departments uh, and that goes into the executive office and daily briefing. Um, so it does become public when it's appropriate, um, but also means that we're able to discuss with businesses, what are you doing? For sure, the furlough scheme has been a fantastic tool for protecting employment longer term in, in Northern Ireland. And if I look at the kind of teleconferences and video conferences I've done with, with companies here, they will universally state that if the furlough scheme had not been there, there would have been many more redundancies early on in the process. It's given them time to think, time to reconfigure and time to plan the business for the future. So I think that's been important. We are very aware that in the kind of last two weeks, next two weeks, it's kind of a key period because businesses are would have to start consultations for future potential redundancies as the furlough scheme comes to an end. Um, so we have been kind of ramping up our engagement with them around what they can do. One thing we're very keen on is where we can support R&D because it's true that the absence of industrial and consumer demand is the biggest challenges businesses have identified. That was the number one item in the evidence-based work we, uh, we, we went through. We can't do much about stimulating demand. We can help businesses look overseas, and that's, I think, a really big opportunity. Don't, if your existing market is shrunk to half the size, go to the next one. And I know it's going to be tough and even more competitive than it would have been a year ago, but you know, we can help building those kind of capabilities and do export skills workshops, we can talk to people about customs and logistics and all the kind of practicalities of doing that as well as the business planning. So we are helping with that. Uh, and then I do think there's some programs that we are talking to business around R&D. And right now, there's a lot of highly skilled engineers, super trained people who, you know, like, like Bombardier, are not able to do their production work, but they could be redeployed into R&D work and actually advance the the kind of the future of the company for the next few years time. So we, we are kind of very interested in that and um, very interested in how we can kind of redeploy any available R&D or innovation funds to support businesses during that time. Okay. Your slave. Sorry, God. Can I maybe just, just add, sorry, Donald here, just yeah. maybe just add to that um, in terms of the points that Kevin has made. Um, yes, there, there have been some redundancies, but fortunately, for those companies that we're working intensively with, they, they had peaked at somewhere in the order of about 42,000 employees on furlough. That, that number now in terms of returners is about 15,500. So through all of the engagement that Kevin has been talking about, um, it's actually encouraging and reassuring to see that um, over 400 companies have now started to take all or some of their employees back in from furlough. Okay, but it obviously is, is a risk period. I think it's a period. Yeah, still we all are concerned about, and I'm sure you, you have identified that and you're very much aware of it. Yeah. Just on slide 20, the, the regional spread, um, it does seem to be quite a lot of jobs have been offered. You talk about offers to SMEs, 91%. What does that mean, offers to SMEs? Is that offers of support? Or is that... Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, so that, that's offers of support, yeah. 
and it's not actually jobs as such or no, it's, it's offers. So there was uh, there were three thousand offers made in the twenty nineteen. Ninety one percent of those were to um, to SMEs. So it's so it will, it will be where an SME has come to us with a proposal. I mean, we're we're business driven, business demand driven. It's where they come to us with a proposal for I don't know, entering a new market or building a new skill set or introducing a new technology. And they've said, we'll do this, but we can't fund it entirely or we need some support and assistance. And we'll bring two things. One is expertise to so where we can and that we will deliver and work with the company. Uh, and then where we can, we'll provide the offer, which will be you know, contractual commitment of, OK, we'll bring this if you do that and we'll fund it as you do that. So it's kind of milestone based as they as they go through the project. The 74 percent offers made to companies outside Belfast. Yeah. yeah, that's all companies, including manufacturing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the total total group. Yeah, and that's offers. Just what does that mean? Offers. So that, yeah. So that's um that's similar. That would be where so, so from the offers, ninety one percent are with SMEs, and for the so the an offer letter is when a business comes with a proposal of something they want to do. Um, the offer then would be it's a contract where. We will say that um, if you want to um, build a new kind of faster machine so you improve your productivity and you're able to compete more in new markets, uh, we will assist you through that with, with the expertise and then with, uh, with, with funding. Okay. Sure, the last point just is about um, moving forward then. You have talked positively about exports and you feel yeah. there's, a, a, you know, there's huge potential to increase exports as we've talked about here. For a number of years, it has always been one of our weak areas. You do see, Kevin, a lot of potential there. And I think we all uh, recognise the other recent job creation, positive news that has come through, in, mainly in the cyber security and IT system. So I think we would all uh, recognise the good work that has been done on that. And, and it's important that we continue to develop that and take up any opportunities that there are in relation to that. And I know there's a lot of interest and excitement out there about especially about cyber security and it's important that we do all we can to, to move forward on it at this time so thanks for your presentation thanks chair thanks gordon and um, can we bring gary into the, the spotlight yes chair hopefully you can hear me yep. you can uh, Chair, um, uh, thanks, uh, Kevin and, and Donald, for that presentation. Uh, like others, I want to thank you uh, and your um, organisation for the, the information, the communication, particularly around the uh, Northern Ireland Business Info website. Uh, I find that particularly helpful, and I know that many businesses uh, find that helpful as well. Uh, in terms of, and uh, much has been talked about around businesses adapting and changing to meet the demands, particularly, you know, I think of some local businesses, Newprint and Block Blinds, O'Neill's, who have been making PPE uh, and, and been doing fantastic work. Now, that conversation has moved on um, through the, the London Chamber. Uh, they raised some concerns around uh, procurement issues, ensuring that we can uh, meet that demand locally. Uh, what role uh, does Invest MI play in terms of that conversation? Uh, you know, I, I've seen some evidence of the Scottish model where they have adopted a, a buy and make strategy where you know they, they can establish a new supply chain of locally produced locally procured readily available ppe is, is this something that we can do similarly um to to not only meet the ppe demands but also to as gordon has said to give i suppose uh, support to some of those businesses whose operations have slowed in the area that they traditionally would have worked in Yes, so th thanks for the for the question on that. I, mean, I, th I do think it's a really interesting area, and it is an area where I think we are able to play quite a unique role. So in the end, I mean, companies make products. Be, I have been impressed in how quickly they can adapt. Some of the companies you mentioned, like O'Neill's, I think it's eight days that they move from sports jerseys to scrubs. I mean, it's amazing actually. That, you know, I've run lots of factories. It's hard to change a factory from one product line to another. I think they were able to do it at incredible speed. Um, so the last three months, that's worked. You're right, what's the next bit? And, and how can you kind of lock it in? Um, and we are in, you know, very actively engaged with companies 
to see for the future, how can we configure it in a more permanent way? And that means two things. One is you know, perhaps the products that you introduce right in the beginning need to be adapted so that they stay competitive, that you can perhaps make them at um, lower cost. Uh, and then because we're in this, um, I think, quite interesting position, we are a government, but we're kind of business minded. I think we're quite well placed to talk to government purchasing departments around the potentials and benefits of domestic supply and then also help companies in a kind of you know legal and correct way try and navigate procurement rules. So, so we do engage with the CPD, we do engage with the um, Department of Health and Social Care here. Uh, and we have had, you know, very recently, last week, the week before, some quite open discussions around, you know, what would be a future supply strategy providing these kind of products that would have a strong local component, but not completely remove the opportunity for external suppliers to compete as well. And, you know, there's a balance, I think, to, to, how to produce, there's a balance to get right there and can good procurement practice good use of government money by the buyer. Um, but I, I think if we, I, th I think we can play a good role in making that, that formula work to the benefit of local companies and to the um, suppliers here. And then the, we started with simple things. I mean, protective equipment, simple medical equipment, you know, it'd be great if we can kind of move up to the next level of some of the more sophisticated things, because then that can tie into some of the other work being done in city deals, city and growth deals around, you know, here with, um, um, clinical trials and novel technologies, new therapies for new treatments. Uh, and if we can build from this work up to some of those, I think it can address many of the challenges for the Northern Ireland economy for the, for the future. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe just, Gary, just to add to that is, is uh, in addition, a lot of our technical staff. So we've got um, technology executives, we've got operational excellence executives. Um, they have been working specifically on a one-to-one -one basis with companies in order to make sure that they have the capability to repurpose to exactly what, what Kevin said. And some of those businesses are now not just simply looking at that as a short-term opportunity. They're looking at that as, a, as, as a, a, an opportunity to, um, to expand their business into those other areas going forward. Okay. Well, thanks for that. Uh, that that's actually very positive. So, um... One of the concerns, uh, particularly from some of those local businesses, is going to be the speed in which these things can be done. They appreciate when it comes to procurement and ensuring that things are done right. Um, that, that, that sometimes that's not always the quickest, but I, I do look at the Scottish model and the fact that they could do it a, a very quick turnaround. Uh, I think it took them a month to develop this, this strategy, and I appreciate that that's not solely a role uh, for yourselves because there's a role on ourselves as legislators to ensure that we can um, ha have our input. So I, I do welcome that. I, I just know that some of the local businesses have done very well um, in, in terms of creating the PPE. Some of them now have issues in terms of space um, to, to obviously grow the business. Some of them are, are having issues in terms of buying uh, additional machinery uh, to be able to compete for some of those bigger um, some of those bigger contracts. So, uh, look, uh, hopefully that can be an open conversation. And by, by all accounts, by what I'm hearing, uh, you're very much taking this issue seriously. So thanks for that. I do have a, I would like to get a bit more information around city deals, but I don't want that to dominate the conversation today. So maybe, um, I'm sure the chair won't mind, but look, maybe get a conversation at another point around the detail around the city deals. But as I say, uh, thanks for taking the time today. Okay, thank you. And happy to talk about city deals another time. Fascinating subject. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. Um, John Stewart. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, gents, so far for the presentation. Um, very informative. Um, I do echo the Chair's sentiments of the need to, um, post-COVID here, look at um, an economy and a strategy that is jobs-led and secure jobs-led. And I think if there's one thing we've seen out of this, one positive thing, it's um, the investment and in, in people looking back towards Indigenous businesses and supporting them and trying, to, um, and trying to grow them. And I think that is essential in all of this. Um, I want to dive into um, some of the research you've done with the 1800 hours of direct and intensive interaction with the businesses because I think that will be vital as a litmus test for not just the companies that you work with but companies across Northern Ireland. Um, how have those concerns sort of evolved over the three months or four months of the COVID pandemic um, in terms of cash flow and concerns about supply chain? Where do you think we're at now in terms of that, that access to finance and, and security of supply? And you know, what are your businesses saying 
um, this month compared to two months ago are the real the real concerns they have, and how, what more can we do to, to sort of alleviate those concerns? Yeah, uh, thanks, and, and um, thanks, John. And it's certainly, um, I mean, it's certainly changed actually. I think, for, I mean, for all of us, over the last hundred days, I mean, I mean, it's a thousand days in a hundred days, isn't it? Because things have changed very quickly. Um, you know, right in the beginning, I would say businesses were, I mean, mainly talking about, you know. Can, can I work? Do I work? How do I work safely? You know, the, the, what is this thing? And you know, how real is it? And how quickly is it impacting my business? So, I think the first couple of weeks were were very confusing actually for everyone. Um, a lot of the work we did intensively was end of April to middle of May, so over like a two week, um, three week period. I would say that the mind state of businesses then was um, very much around. Um, still kind of in the emergency and beginning to think of recovery clearly you know like i said number one on their mind it was always um it was always um consumer demand and industrial demand if you don't have a market what can you do and so you have to adapt or change but you know all markets were shrinking at the same time nearly all markets i mean you know some healthcare things were growing and some home working teleconferencing systems were growing but generally there was a, a, a big crash in economic demand so that was the first thing that they were looking at second thing was um cash flow um, and i know in the first three weeks that was probably the top priority of businesses when we did it which was um kind of six weeks later i think cash flow came out as number two but i know it's still a very real issue for many businesses across northern ireland today uh, and you know, some of the cash flow challenges have been postponed and kind of moved a bit further down the road rather than necessarily solved. So businesses, as they come back on stream, can start generating cash again, but there will be some who've taken on more debt or who will need to renew debt later in the year. Uh, and I think we do need to think ahead about what kind of government response and what kind of commercial response we could help facilitate um, to do that. The other issues they were looking at were um, connectivity, which has been an issue. Um, some of the businesses who did very well actually out of COVID, a lot of them kind of cybersecurity, uh, software development centers, um, you know, call center, contact center, su support and service centers, they actually did really well during um, COVID because they were able to get people home. Northern Ireland demonstrated it's got a good uh, digital connectivity, good people who will kind of get on with um, providing support a lot better than many other um, locations around the world. But there is a recognition that to keep getting new business into those centers, you've, you've got to travel, you've got to be able to get out and bring potential customers here. And, and that, that has been um, becoming, I think, more of a challenge um, kind of later on. Uh, and then supply chain, I think, has been the, the kind of the, the fourth big area. Right in the beginning of the crisis, businesses were able to keep ticking over with the supplies they have. And even lean run businesses will have, you know, four weeks, six weeks of stock in house. But as you come six weeks into the crisis or eight weeks or 10 weeks, if you're not able to replenish your supply lines, you can end up having 99% of what you want to make, but one critical component missing. And that means you can't produce it. Uh, and I know a lot of kind of diagnostics companies around the UK found that and they couldn't find the biological standards or something, then you, you can't really produce anything. Um, so I think the, that was the kind of fourth thing they were, they were looking at. Um, and now there are, you know, businesses who are saying that we, there are businesses who are saying we've demonstrated resilience, we've shown the strength we've done during this period. How can we use that as a kind of, you know, as a tool to bring more business into Northern Ireland? Uh, and I've certainly had some, I think, some very positive discussions with U.S. head offices in the last couple of weeks and with head offices for some international companies for, for what we can do in the future. Um, so I think there will be some sector growth in that area, you know, which means that we can also focus on kind of helping some of the sectors which will be challenged and which will have a slower growth curve. Uh, and we know that in places like in, in aerospace, I mean, it's going to take time. I mean, there are so many fewer flights and so many cancelled airplanes and then cancelled components for planes that you know looking really I think intelligently and strategically into how we can help those rebuild is going to be really uh, really important and I'm quite a good body of work and I know there's you know representations and proposals for what that industry could do you know for example you know how can you make a greener more sustainable economy 
through you know zero carbon producing planes of the future and can you use these kind of two or three year four year period where there wouldn't be so much demand to try and help the aerospace industry here and in the uk reconfigure in a better way so i think some sectors like that will be quite quite interesting to look at thanks Kevin. i mean yeah you make some very valid points naturally that's your job to do so. I mean, I totally agree. Um, this will shine a light on some of the, the great examples of companies that have shown resilience and ability to adapt, and some will come out well. Others, through no fault of their own, have maybe taken on debts or holding out, um, trying to get through this. But my fear, and I think a fear of a lot of people, is this is going to this is going to be um, highly impacting on our economy for a long time to come and that I worry companies racking up debts and not being able to see the light at the end of the tunnel as quickly as maybe they thought, we could start to see job losses on the back of that. So I do hope that either through Westminster and through the executive here, we can see a reprioritisation of funding in order to maybe extend grant support and to help those companies survive who have done all they can. As I say, they've demonstrated for years in Northern Ireland mass resilience in our businesses, from the micro right up to um, the internationals that are based here, but I just fear that without the support, um, and granted there has been grant support to date for some, but you know, the, with a max grant of 25,000, it's a drop in the ocean to some of the companies uh, and our big right. employers, and I think w we do need to look at maybe trying to broaden that out to have a real, real hardship fund for big companies to try and help them survive. Yeah, and, and I think um, just to comment as well, I mean, our R&D as well is, I mean, I, you know, I, I would certainly love to have access to a, a bigger a pool of R&D funding, you know, in the kind of next 18 months. And, you know, as we, I, I think, shared you know, a number of times through to kind of, you know, Westminster is you know, the ERDF funding, the European Research and Development funding we're able to deploy. I think it's been powerful in Northern Ireland. We, we've been able to deploy 96 million pounds of it. It's brought another... 400 million pounds of investment into R&D and innovation in Northern Ireland, but that that will come to an end um, at the end of this year in terms of our ability to, you know, deploy new funds into new R&D projects. Um, I, I know there are various kind of projects within Westminster for shared prosperity funds to replace that. Uh, I know also that UKRI has got significant budgets, um, another nine billion pounds, I think, were announced last week for that. So there is more money into um are, but a lot of what Northern Ireland needs is D, the development side, the kind of near commercialization side, and really any support that you know, we can get from the committee and from you know, the kind of different you know, parties across Northern Ireland to try and bring forward this shared prosperity fund to replace particularly the R&D part of the ERDF funding would be, would be very much appreciated um, by the kind of businesses in, in Northern Ireland during this kind of critical period. Thanks, Kevin. Hopefully, maybe get a chance to come back in. Thanks, um, John. And just to, to pick up very briefly on, on John's points there around um, the support um, for businesses, the bids that were made by Invest um, in June monitoring, could you maybe talk us through those in a wee bit more detail? We had Brexit officials in with us last week, and they were talking about how the um, business support that are being developed at the minute are both linked to COVID um, and also to, to support businesses prepare for Brexit. So if you can maybe give us a wee bit more detail on those. Um, yeah, I, I will comment on that. So we, we, um, we put together, um, you know, I think 22 bids actually. We really kind of explored, you know, creatively and also we, we solicited input from a lot of business organisations and businesses. It wasn't our invention for what we bid. It was based on the evidence and based on kind of outreach to, to companies and organizations. We did put them into the kind of five categories I put on one of the earlier slides, starting from the um, you know, safety, safe, safe return to work, digital, um, kind of great Northern Ireland um, challenges and supply chain. Um, so, so, so we did group them into those areas. We have been given funding for the first parts of the bid. So there's been two awards. One, well, the minister awarded 30 million to, um, I think, three weeks ago. And then I think there was an award of 2.2 million to top it up um, last week through the Department of Finance. Um, that means that we've got seven or eight projects that we will move through the final kind of internal approval stages. Um, and then we're working very actively in the project plan for when can we bring those live probably from the end of July 
kind of August, September timeframe, um, but they will cover, you know, helping businesses to do better financial planning, um, some specific support for sectors and helping the particularly challenged sectors, which have got high opportunity afterwards to, to face their problems. Clearly some work in supply chain, like I say, big challenge, but big opportunity as well. Um, and then some things helping SMEs particularly um, kind of improve and how do they face um, COVID. So there's certainly some kind of details that we, we, we've we not released the item by item list yet. I think we need to get our kind of final approvals before we probably should do that. Um, but I can tell you that the preparations for them are very advanced and they are in the five categories that, are, that I showed earlier. Um, John O'Dowd. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, Kevin, a number of weeks ago, we had uh, officials from the department in talking about the apprenticeship programme and how they propose to roll that out on engagement. And um, it was an interesting presentation, as has been yours. But I, I was in my office in Lurgan during that presentation, and I said to them, I'm looking out my window here, and I'm seeing the economic activity going on around the town. Um, and obviously, there is the businesses you would see uh, in, in, in a town centre. Uh, but there was also a lot of tradespeople about the that term, which is politically not correct anymore, the white van man, uh, who, 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 and all, all that work that goes on with it. And I wasn't sure if the apprenticeship scheme fitted with the economic activity I was witnessing. And I'm not sure Invest NI's vision for the next number of years fits with the economic activity I'm seeing or likely to see in the next couple of years. Because I, I accept that we have to have a vision for the future, where we want to be. But I think things have changed so much that we have to, uh, for the next number of years, um, secure what we have and invest in the small medium enterprises uh, in our society across a, a wide range, not just high tech uh, and, and future industries, but we, the programme of work ahead for us is securing what we have. Uh, and is Invest in I responsive enough to do that? So, um, a couple of comments, John. Thanks for that. First thing is, I mean, it, it, white van man is still kind of you know very key part of the economy and is very active actually. And looking out of my window as well, I see a lot of them um, working, and many of them have been working the last um, two or three weeks. So it's not just the kind of you know white Apple Mac on your desktop that's the future. There is you know both both parts fit um, side by side. Um, I, I kind of agree with you. We need to protect. Um, some of the businesses um, and you know from kind of running lots of companies if you want to grow one of the first things you do is try and protect what you've got at home because you don't want to it, it, it costs more generally to invest in new markets and invest in new technology and invest in new things than it does to grow what you've got I mean that's normally the rule so you don't want to spend all of your money doing something new and meanwhile, you, you take your eye off the ball and the things you have been doing kind of evaporate because someone else comes in and does them better. So I agree with you um, that we need to protect that. I do think Invest in I is actually quite good at adapting. And I think, um, you know, as I've seen in many businesses in the last um, three months completely change what they do, we've changed dramatically, actually. And if I look at, you know, I mean, we, we're not out doing trade fairs and we're not um, escorting kind of new businesses into new markets, we're having to do everything virtually. And it's a bit painful sometimes, but we are getting it done. And in some ways, I think like businesses, we're learning that, you know what, actually the, the experience and the expertise we've got, if we deliver them you know, digitally, we actually reach more people more quickly. Uh, and we can help even the kind of the man in the van type of businesses to kind of improve what they do with giving them access to things that they wouldn't they wouldn't do otherwise because I, I can't see the people you saw out of your window in Lurgan going to spend a day in a classroom in in um, in Carrick Fergus to, to learn around cash flow management. Um, but I can see them kind of accessing some of the tools which are available on a kind of Sunday evening or a Saturday morning to help them deal with um, kind of better greening technology for your vehicle and things like that. So I, mean, I, I do think we can uh, we can adapt to, to things like that. And I do think actually some of the delivery tools we've learned through COVID will help us deliver more and more to some of the smaller businesses 
as well as the, some of the big businesses, which does tend to be more curated, complex, strategic, long-term, big R and D. Um, so I hope we can uh, we can deal with some of that. Um, and obviously, you mentioned that there's high tech on the pharmaceutical industry in, in the Greater Craigavon, Bombridge, Poor Down areas, which employ significant numbers of people uh, yeah. as well. So. But it is, it's that adaptability I'm, I'm interested in. In relation to PPE um, and the relaxation of the state aid rules by the European uh, institutions, Scotland has, has taken the initiative on and, and started to support local textile companies in producing PPE. Uh, have you, have, has Invest in I looked at it in terms of how you can redirect some of your investments, but particularly when you were looking at the June monitoring round, how you can support local textile industries to do that. And, and I use the example because, again, I, I don't want you to sound parochial, but we all are. Uh, Lurgan had a long and rich tradition, as had Banbridge, right up through that, that Ban Valley of textile industries, which have now gone for a variety of reasons, uh, global economy being one of them. But I was speaking to a number of t small textile firms recently who had bid for PPE contracts during the COVID-19 crisis. And they tell me that the person or one of the companies that won the contract was actually a furniture manufacturer who then subcontracted the contract to them, which I found amazing and interesting. But it just seems to me that uh, those who are equipped to bid for contracts are more likely to win the contract rather than those who are equipped to produce the goods are more likely to win the contract. So I think that all has to be looked at. But have you looked in terms of, of realigning your, your, your funding towards supporting companies now that state aid rules have been relaxed? Yeah, let, let me comment two things. First, first thing is actually, I mean, there is a skill in tendering and winning bids, actually, and, uh, and we are kind of very keen to help companies be good at that. And, and I think there's a massive difference between companies who are good at it and companies who are just less experienced at it. So, and we do support initiatives to do that. The most recent one, I think, is... Uh, some of the LED work we're doing in uh, in Newry, sure. and, and in Newry over the next, I think it's four years, we're running a program. I can't remember the name exactly, but it's a. Uh, it's a tenor program. It's uh, anyway, we're running a program. I, I, I didn't catch it, but I mean, it's a, it's kind of doing tenders better or perfect tendering for people or something like that. And we will help over those three years, together with the local council companies in that area, to to learn how to tender, because I, I really think it's um, it's a big skill and uh, really important. Uh, so just to kind of side coming on that. On your first thing on Scotland, we've worked, we, we've talked to the Scottish around what they're doing. We, we've gone as respectfully as we can in great detail with them about what they're doing. And we do actually collaborate, I think, with the with FBI and Enterprise Scotland very closely, and you know we sh we ship we compete for some things. We compete for investors, so we don't tell each other everything, but we do share things where where I think it's useful for the DAs to do that. And we have looked at the kind of projects that can be useful for textiles. Um, I've looked at it. I've certainly asked for some more information around whether or not this makes sense. I have heard some representations from textile companies about. If we do it this way as individuals, there's one pathway. If we did it bigger and we're able to use some of the state aid funds, potentially even financial transactions capital, that would potentially give them um, benefits and be able to help the project get off the ground quickly and minimize some of the risk that some um, individual companies would take on. <clears throat> because you, with, with some of these PPEs, I mean, if there was a vaccine tomorrow, PPE need would be less. There won't be a vaccine tomorrow, but there could be in March next year. So if you're looking at a one-year investment project with significant capital required, I can imagine people to hesitate um, to do that. So we, we are looking at that, John, and that that project, I, I don't know. My, I, don't, I don't know whether that will be one that would get funded and will really get built together, but we're certainly kind of exploring the idea quite, quite actively. Uh, and we have received um, some interesting representations for that. Just one quick question. And, and it's worth pointing out that uh, medical staff wear PPE all year round, whether there's COVID or not. Yeah. The, question, the, the problem was there was a shortage of it, so there is a, a long-term business plan there uh, to be developed. Uh, the department recently surrendered £53 million of business support funding. Um, have you, Invest NI engaged with the department as to how best that money should be reinvested? 
We, so we are uh, so we, so we submitted twenty two bids for the recovery program, and we've been awarded I think um, seven or eight. Uh, I hope that's not the end of the story, and that as we go into the kind of later monitoring rounds, or even in between, that there will be opportunities for us to to, to bid for um, for more um, for more funds, or and either from the list that we submitted, but you know that was five, six weeks ago, I think. So I also recognize the world has changed a bit since then. And if we were bidding now, we would probably adapt a little bit. Um, but we certainly, we we're certainly keen to be able to seek more funds, receive more funds, and then deploy them for the benefit of companies in the recovery. And whether it comes through the money that's recovered from funds that weren't deployed in the kind of grant programs, or whether it comes from new things announced by the chancellor, hopefully later today, or the mechanism we you know kind of agnostic to that but we are very keen to try to do whatever we can and that with greater funding we can do more and i do think there's a time window that you know businesses will need to do things you know in the latter half of this year and not think about it for six months and do something next year so i do, I do hope some morning months some more funds will come our way and we will be ready to deploy them okay and you'll think of white van man and woman when you're doing that I will do it. Indeed. I'll kind of take a drive to Lurgan one day and have a, have a snoop around. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Sinead? Oh, can we bring Sinead into the spotlight? Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Good morning. Um, thank you very much, Kevin, for that presentation. It was very, very helpful. Uh, and congratulations to your team as well, because it has been a difficult period. Uh, and, and you, you as an organisation, had to repurpose very, very quickly as well in order to adapt and respond to the uh, pandemic uh, uh, and the crisis that we were facing, because it wasn't just um, a health crisis, but it was an economic crisis. Uh, and a lot of people were very desperate. And if you uh, received some of the phone calls that we received, which I know out you did um, it was very distressful uh, and it still remains distressful for some of those businesses but um, in in relation to um, you spoke about you know 450 firms um, adapted operations in order to respond and that that is amazing because it just shows the agility the resilience and the capability of our businesses in Northern Ireland that they are able to respond and adapt so quickly uh, and the innovation that they have within their workforces to do that um, and do it under pressure so I think that that is, uh, is something that's really good that has come out of COVID um, and uh, it's something that we should really work on um, uh, as an economy in order to make sure that we allow that agility uh, and we make sure that we remove barriers for businesses, um, that we can allow them to actually be as innovative. Sometimes we're, we're a wee bit too stringent with our, with our economic policies and, and don't allow for that level of adaptability. So, that, that, so that's good. And, and um, um, I too have spoken to many business organisations, uh, and particularly here at, at home in Derry, uh, and you know they see this as an opportunity as well, so that they could. They, it's not just about their supply chains, but it's about the security of supply chains. Whenever you're under a threat and a, a, from from a pandemic like this here, it's really important that you have that security of the supply chains. And the closer it is to home, the absolute better it is for, for them. So I think that there is an opportunity for Northern Ireland and Derry was uh, you know the, the, the city of, of multiple factories um, uh, in our past and um, I think that we have uh, it in our DNA to respond to some of those uh, requirements uh, and we shouldn't be looking to China and we shouldn't be looking to too far off places to secure that going forward and as John said earlier you know there's always a need for PPE and we've demonstrated that we can meet that need uh, and very successful in it and and, and, and probably uh, at least we, we know where our uh, products are coming from because that has been a difficulty as well. Um, whenever we have been out to worldwide pr procurement, we're not actually too sure of, of, of uh, the level uh, and uh, of, of the, the stuff that we're buying. And we've fallen into a few traps there as well. So uh, the closer we are to home um, and are using our neighbours and uh, that to secure our supplies, the better. And I think that's uh, important. And the other thing that I would say is, um, I suppose, you know, 
talking to business organizations and businesses now they are in desperation they're ha- some of them are hanging on by their you know their fingernails and yet we have brexit coming um at our uh, at our feet and, 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 and clicking at us and we don't hear from the executive's point we don't hear any conversation we haven't even in the assembly had a decent conversation about brexit at all and um we we, we are concerned about it and they're Businesses are concerned about what support they are is going to be put in place for them in order to meet the needs of uh, Brexit. You know what what kind of digital support, financial support. You know, none of us knows what kind of deal we're going to get, um, but we do know that there will be barriers uh, in terms of our export and import, particularly uh, from um, GB into in, into Northern Ireland. And they are concerned that this is another um, another impact on their businesses while they are just clinging on. Uh, and, and, and what are you doing about it? You know, we've looked at the future a bit. So what are you doing about it? And then finally, um, uh, I want to talk about um, Invest AMI. Uh, you've said in your um, slide, slide uh, 12 that you've attracted 28 new investors into Northern Ireland. That was in the year uh, 2019 to 2020 and obviously um, I suppose if things had been um, maybe normal that would be quite quite larger than that um, as, you, as you said that you had a good supply but I have been doing just some research and um, over the last three financial years from 2017 to 2020 there's um, some 2,406 jobs from men with investor, uh, investors and they're all of that, all of those, uh, let me see, just to give you the first uh, thing, uh, 2,406 2, were allocated into Belfast and only 282 of those new jobs came to Derry since 2017. And that was by new inward investors. So. I really am concerned, and you'll, I, I say it every single time, and I will comp- continue to say it, this is not balanced, this is not equal, this is not fair, because Derry and other places, I'm not just saying Derry, but other places outside Belfast are not getting a, a, a fair whack at this, and the second city in Northern Ireland has been treated disgracefully, and, and, and we need to change the strategic or your terms of reference within your organisation that, that you have to balance uh, the inward investment. Now, I know the argument is going to be investors choose where they want to invest, but they choose where they want to invest based on other um, economic policies like skills, like connectivity, etc. So if there's an imbalance in the economic system and the economic policy, then there's an imbalance in what you can do for, for dairy. But you need to be targeted with investment, getting investment into this city and then into this region. So those are three or four different areas uh, from from congratulations into Brexit, but into supply chains, but also into a fair and equal uh, investment into the rest of Northern Ireland, not just Belfast. I mean, that's 82% of new investors into Belfast in the last three years. Shocking. Kevin, do you want to come in briefly? Yeah, it's just we, we have um, sorry, Kevin. We, yeah, just um, can can we make it as brief as possible because we still right. have our next witness is um waiting as well. Thank you. Okay, and um, yeah, I'm be happy to have a, a longer discussion on the kind of any of those items, um, Sinead, and uh, thank you, thank you for your for your comments uh, on the uh, the last part. You know, you know, I, you know, I. I the, the first uh, factory I visited was in uh, Derry. I was in uh, Seagate, uh, I think, three weeks or two weeks after starting the job. Uh, we went into the kind of technology factory there. I thought it was amazing. I visited some other um, companies there who manage the uh, supply chain of food in Australia, really interesting um, companies who, who do things there. So I, I have seen some interesting businesses uh, uh, in Derry. I was also in, the, in Derry the day that uh, NDNA, the New Decade New Approach, was uh, was launched. I was reading the printout in the car uh, while someone was driving at kind of 6 a.m. just trying to see what was in there. And I think there's some very interesting um, uh, things that are happening, part of the kind of future 
funds and work thrive, I think is quite interesting. And what we can do in um, clinical there, I think the medical school will be, will be very interesting in what that brings. Um, so, I, so I do think there's some, a lot of connection that we'll be doing in, uh, in Derry in the future. And I know that our local team work very closely with the council there and the local economic development to try and do that. For the investment into Northern Ireland, you know, it was, it was a big year, actually. 28 was, was a lot. Um, uh, new investors do, we're trying to bring them into Northern Ireland uh, and then also make sure they, they stick in Northern Ireland. Uh, I'd, probably one comment I'll make in a short time is that we had 28 first-time investors in Northern Ireland. We had 201 expansion projects within Northern Ireland. Uh, and, and I know that um, Derry benefits also that people may land in Belfast, but they also come across the country, as we've seen with Allstate or with uh, uh, Danske Bank or with, um, with, with Fintry. So uh, we'll, we'll certainly kind of work as closely as we can with your team to, um, to help them do that. Uh, and then if we look at Brexit, definitely it's coming towards us really quickly. We should look actually at what these kind of border areas can do, actually, because there are threats with Brexit. And I know the risks and I've been through many hours of discussion on them, but there can be interesting opportunities as well. And I, and I do think that there are things we can look at in the kind of newries and the dairies and the places just across the border from Dundalk that might actually be quite interesting in kind of ecosystems and uh, cross well, trade in the future. So I'm happy to, um, to have a look at that. Uh, and then security supply, you know, strong manufacturing in dairy. I've seen it. It's Seagate was fantastic. And uh, uh, let's see what we can do with that in the future. Um, but perhaps a longer discussion one day, Sinead, on that. Yeah, I think I need it one to one, really. <laughs> yeah, happy to do that. And um, we would maybe like to pick up with you in um, a more informal briefing um, at some point um, in the next wee while to have a, a longer discussion. But thank you to yourself and to Donald and Dermot for, for joining us this morning. It has been really useful. Okay, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So we're now well, moving on to our next item, which is our briefing um, from the NI Tourism Alliance and the Hotels Federation on the reopening <coughs> and recovery of the tourism sector. Um, so I'd like to bring into the spotlight Joanne Stewart, Janice Skulls, Eddie McKeever, Kieran O'Neill and Una O'Reilly, please. Oh, right. We'll be very positive, I hope. <laughs> And we also need to bring in Janice, Janice. and Karen. Here we go. Here we go. I'm in. Everybody, um, yep, yep. So welcome to the, our meeting this morning and, and apologies for keeping you waiting there for a little bit. Um, if you would maybe like to go to, to Eddie and Kieran to give us a, a wee bit of a, an overview of how um, over, the reopening has been over the past few days and how um, all of that is going. Who do you want to start? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm Kerry Dunn, uh, the managing director of Bishopsgate Hotel in Derry. Um, yes, so we opened the doors on Friday. We're delighted to take that opportunity. Um, and get the doors open on the 3rd, given the original date was the 10th of September. So um, we'd like to thank everybody involved who have worked to get it open for the 3rd of, of July. Um, it's been a very strong first weekend in terms of food and beverage. A lot of people are interested in coming back out again. Um, the rooms piece has been very slow, about 40 or 50% occupancy. And um, our five hotels still remain closed in the city at the moment. So we were one of five that opened. Mainly the city in the city the hotels opened. Um, and as I say, it was, it was extremely busy for food and beverage, people looking to come out. Obviously, we're all working on limited capacities. Our capacity is down 38%. So uh, we had a full house based on that over the weekend. Yep. Um, do this for myself there. Um, it's very similar to Kieran. Um, the food and beverage local business was quite strong. Um, through all the properties. Um, but the bedrooms were a bit of a, a non-event. Um, a lot of inquiries about is it safe to come, what sort of measures we've got in place, things like that. Um, but um, not many people booking yet. Um, our hotels would be a lot of corporate business and things like that, which is obviously um, pretty much non-existent at the moment. 
So um, we'll be hoping to make contact with them and hopefully see how they go to come out. Yeah. Okay. That's, look, that's really good to get that um, feedback from from yourselves directly. I would maybe hand over then to to Janice. Thank you. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, just, to, just to say, we've gone through the figures today. Uh, it looks about 50% of hotels opened over the weekend. We feel that the majority of them will open throughout the month of July, with everybody really intending to be open by the end of the summer. The figures that you've given are indicative. It's about probably we're going to sit somewhere to 30 40% occupancy. Food and beverage very strong and quite a number of our normal income streams are cut off. Uh, business tourism will be low in the meantime, no international visitors, probably over the summer. In the medium term, we would hope to get the GB market back and there is a certain amount of activity on that. Um, for us, we see the really difficult time of trading is going to be really from September through to next March. Last year, it looked as if we would break the billion pound mark in terms of tourism spend. We reckon that that will probably be back to about 400,000 pounds this year if we're lucky. Um, and from our point of view, I mean, we're prepared to give it a go. I think everybody has risen to that challenge. Um, we've weddings starting this weekend. Um, we've other bits and pieces to get opened over the summer. But in reality, it's a question of what, what will happen next year. And I think it's a question of what parts of the industry can we ensure survive that go forward and make sure that we return to the very vibrant industry that we were. Okay, thank you, Jonas. Um, if Joanne, do you really want to come in then and give us a bit of an, an overview as well? Okay, thank you very much, Chair, um, for the invitation to brief the brief the committee. Um, obviously, as you've heard, we've uh, we've had a lot of the the hotel sector open. Uh, we also have the visit centres, visitor centres um, open. Uh, tour guides have um, have started with uh, some tours, um, and some of the. Um, Attractions opened, but most of those will um, open towards the end of July um, and beginning of August. I think what has really helped is that over 400 businesses registered for the UK-wide We're Good to Go industry standard. So very much around really providing that confidence and reassurance to visitors that they'll have a safe um, and durable experience. And we're also seeing that some of our uh, businesses are signing up to the AA COVID Confidence, confidence Accreditation Scheme. Um, I think as uh, Janice said, it's critical to the survival of businesses over the winter period that the industry is able to maximise the rest of the, the 20 20 season um, and with schools starting um, sort of within in August that season have you know could be quite a bit shorter than, than expected um, but this will require you know very much around marketing campaigns that reassure and encourage our local visitors to support the local tourism industry um, by booking holidays um, at home we also need to attract visitors from the Republic and GB um, to, to consider Northern Ireland um, as a destination um, and tourism and I have launched their campaign for the whole of Ireland and to Ireland launched a specific Northern Ireland campaign into GB last Friday, uh, which included a number of travel journalists from GB coming over to Northern Ireland for, for the reopening. Um, we've also got a, a marketing campaign starting by the Cabinet Office around Enjoy Summer Safely, and we're engaging with that to ensure that there's Northern Ireland specific um, content within that. Um, and although that's primarily an economic recovery campaign for all sectors, um, there is going to be a specific one for tourism and, and hospitality. What we now need to see is communication um, really from our political leaders um, you know, to encourage people to, to stay local um, and support local businesses um, this year. So it's been positive with the reopening, um, but there are still challenges to overcome. Um, we recently carried out a survey of our members and almost 50% believe it will take at least two to three years for their businesses to recover. There's a swathe of businesses that have been unable to access any financial support, especially the small accommodation and experience providers. We are an important part of the, of the tourism mix. And we've written, I know that the committee have been in communication with the minister on this, and we've also uh, written to her on this. Um, the other aspect is uh, about the international visitors. And, Business models for a lot of our tourism businesses don't stack up with the loss of visitors from the European and international destinations. 
Um, we welcomed the announcement from the UK Home Office last week about 60 exempted countries where the self-isolation will not be required when they arrive. Um, but we're still waiting to hear the decision of the Northern Ireland Executive on whether they will follow suit with our border controls. So at the minute, from Friday, travellers from the exempted countries will be able to travel to England without the need to self-isolate, but not to Northern Ireland. Um, the Republic of Ireland are also keeping their current restrictions in place to at least the 20th of July. Um, we've written to the Department of Health asking for the Northern Ireland position to be clarified, and this needs to be clarified at the soonest opportunity. Um, and you're going to listen here from um, Una um, around business tourism because we still need to get a reopening date um, for the business tourism, such as conferencing um, and exhibitions. Um, and that's really important, and I'll, and I'll let Una talk uh, about that. Um, but just to, to finish from our survey, uh, over 80% responded that the development of a plan to rebuild tourism was critical um, and the work and need for support continues. And this will be an important outcome from the Tourism Recovery Steering Group and the working group established by the, the Minister. What we need to see is a doubling of investment and marketing approach of Northern Ireland, a longer term funding package to support businesses through the winter months, as Janice mentioned, abolishment of APD on short haul flights reduction on VAT, on tourism-related services, um, and a focus on the development of a sustainable tourism industry in Northern Ireland around environment, financial um, and access, and also support for um, employment. Um, but the biggest thing at the moment is to get out and support our, our local businesses by holidaying at home um, this year. Thank you, Joanne. Una, do you want to come in and tell us a wee bit then about the business tourism and the events? Sure, yes. Yeah, so, um, um, thanks very much for the opportunity to brief the committee. I'm the, I'm the sales and marketing director with ICC Belfast, the Waterfront Hall and Ulster Hall, but I also share the meetings, incentives, conference and events um, working group as part of the tourism recovery steering. Um, and I'm also a member of the events industry senior leaders panel, which is hosted by the Minister for Support, Tourism and Heritage. And Nigel Huddleston. So I've been, I suppose, steeped in business tourism, um, not just for my job, but in terms of the, the work that I'm doing outside it. Um, firstly, I suppose I just want to outline the importance of business tourism um, and the business events and what it actually does in terms of economic impact and long term economic development. Um, each delegate that we have that comes from outside of Northern Ireland um, is valued at £488 per day. So a three-day conference with a thousand delegates is worth nearly 1.5 million pounds of new money into Northern Ireland. The largest event we have run this year so far um, in 2020 was AstraZeneca. You will have heard of the news and working on the vaccine for COVID-19. Um, but they brought over 600 delegates for a three-day conference. Um, stayed in a number of hotels, but they also were in 31 different venues and restaurants across Belfast, and that's from St Anne's Cathedral to James Street South and Titanic Belfast. So business tourism is a big piece um, for us. For us as a business, um, COVID-19, and uh, for everybody in the industry, has had severe impact. Um, luckily, what you'll find across is that the vast majority have rescheduled as opposed to cancelled. Um, we also, as the waterfront of Ulster Hall, um, have the local business, um, I suppose the nightlife as such, um, but we have found that our ticket sales are down 85%. Um, and the big call, I suppose, from business tourism and the entertainment venues is that we get an opening date. Um, opening date with regards to the entertainment business, like ourselves, the SSE Arena, we could open our venues within three weeks, but really there's a three month lead time for ticket sales typically. Um, and for us, what we're looking at is well, what for gala dinners, um, for conferences, for events, we do know who the people are. And um, it's not mass gatherings of people who can't be reached. So we do need to know what are the opening times and give us a lead time as to what we can work towards. Um, another piece that we're asking for government is support in terms of the commercial viability. Um, for Northern Ireland. Um, Belfast and Northern Ireland has a conference support scheme and we need to make sure that that's flexible and that's something that we can do to leverage multi-year deals because what we're finding is we have a good order book for 21-22 um, and my, my colleagues across the industry will say well, what are we going to ensure that that, actually, that that actually happens and that they're not just ghost bookings. Um, 
for us what we look, and I know Joanne alluded to this, is that the job retention scheme, we need support and continued support um, because we've been the most affected. We're the first first that had to go into lockdown and most definitely one of the last coming out of it. The Republic of Ireland and um, the professional conference organisers and uh, people that run uh, business events are putting a call in that every um, piece of, I suppose, every order that comes through them gets zero VAT. So to make us competitive in the island of Ireland, we need to look at a VAT reduction. Um, air access, which I know across the board from a tourism perspective, but for us, if we're targeting um, GB and international conferences, we need to ensure that we have got um, air accessibility and then also looking at how we can leverage Dublin. Um, from a market investment, we need to develop the sales and market and assets. We need digital investment. I know ourselves as a business, we have now invested in hybrid events because it's going to be a mixture of in real life and also hybrid, so people logging on a bit like we are today. Um, and the other piece is that we do need a digital market and investment. The Ambassador Programme, which has been supported by Invest Northern Ireland, um, there's research as part of the, the Tourism Northern Ireland's um, 2030 business tourism strategy, but it's common that the number one reason people choose a destination for a business event is actually related to your expertise in that area. So FinTech, for example, with, with Northern Ireland, like Sciences, but 79% of all conferences that come to Northern Ireland come by a local ambassador. So it's how do we galvanise the, the business community, the academia, our medics to actually champion to bring the conferences here. And then finally, support for the industry, and that's support for site visits, um, for, for mineralisation trips, and then sales and marketing support, and support, support for um, PCOs and event organisers in terms of supporting them to help us sell Northern Ireland. Thank you. Thank you very much. That, that's um, really useful to get that that detail. Um, just to pick up on, on a few things. Um, obviously, it is good that, that, that we have the reopening has happened, and you know that we're looking at, at, at future dates as well. Um, we will continue to highlight the, the need for for those dates for reopening um, for other sectors, and I know that the executive is continuing to look at those on on a, a, a daily and weekly basis. Um, and I also know in relation to the, the furlough scheme that the, the finance minister is continuing to, to highlight the need for flexibility and in particular sectoral fle flexibility and potentially regional flexibility as well, um, as we've seen uh, elsewhere once things begin to, to reopen that, that we you know there may be like lockdowns in particular areas and you know businesses may need to close for a period of time and that that, you know that they will need support through through that as well, and obviously that's not something we want to see, but we need to be prepared for. Um, in terms of the the work of the steering group, it would maybe just be useful to get a, a, an update on that. Um, and the you know where the British Chancellor is going to make um, his statement later on today, and there has been some speculation around the the likes of the VAT rate um, being included in that, and also um, over the weekend. Some discussion around um, a voucher scheme, something I know as a party we had um, proposed in the south would be a, a, a kind of staycation voucher that would support the the, re or the hospitality and tourism sectors. Um, and I was just wondering if there has been discussion around that um, from yourselves or the potential for for a scheme like that. What would what that might look like? I'm not sure if you want to. Discuss. Sorry, there has been some talk around the voucher scheme uh, for stays within Northern Ireland. I understand that uh, Tourism Northern Ireland are putting a bid together to the department to look at that, to see is there a way of offering a stimulation package where people spend at home. In certain countries in Europe, most notably France, have always had a scheme like this, where people were given a proportion of their stay or a sum of money which they could use to contribute to stay, use as a staycation. Um, I think the Minister's intention is that the recovery um, steering group would stay in place for a period of time and look at the overall work of all the different subgroups to ensure that the sector did come up with a suitable plan to see it through the next probably 18 to 24 months with a view to looking how monies and what stimulation packages outside the normal packages can be put in place. 
um, and that that would be an opportunity for us to maybe grow and look at us as a destination in a slightly different way than we've traditionally done so. This year is definitely the year of the staycation, but we should not take our eye off the ball of what next year will bring. And that's very important for the wider sector that we get that international uh, visitor back, be it either for leisure or business tourism. And that's an important thing. There's a much wider picture here, particularly around air travel and pieces of information like that that are very important to us. Um, But that is the moment. In the short term, the staycation thing and the fact that we could have a voucher would give us really the ability to compete on the island of Ireland, particularly if a similar scheme is put into place in the south. John, let's just maybe pick up, um, and I know I've had some conversations with you around this previously, um, in terms of the, the consumer confidence. Um, and I know that we have a, a paper in our pack from Nilga and Solis. Oh, can I take feedback? That's a warning. Like an alarm. Janice, Janice, um, Eddie and, and Eddie are in the ground set. I'm not sure if an alarm is going Book alarm. Some kind of alarm. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. We're, we we're, go. Let's go. Um, <laughs> <don't> apologies <laughs> for that. It's a me. Sorry. We don't know. Okay. It has stopped now. Um. Sorry, I, I've lost my train of thought. What was I saying? You were asking Janice. And you were asking oh, about yeah, consumer sorry, confidence about consumer and sentiment. Confidence. Apology. It's, um, yes. In terms of the measures that um, have been put in place in hotels and restaurants, if you maybe could just talk to that for a, a second, in terms of encouraging people to get back out and about safely. Um, the consumer sentiment piece and the confidence piece, first of all, there have been an ongoing surveys throughout COVID based on, I think, on a two weekly, weekly and sort of monthly run, looking at how people look, first of all, done by Tourism Northern Ireland on Fulch Ireland in relation to people on the island of Ireland to see how their sentiment moved. Um, a number of people, it has moved a bit, it hasn't moved really as far as I think people thought, but people do still want to travel and there is kind of a desire to have a holiday at home. I think the figure is like 50% of people who are going to try and have a holiday before the end of 2020. With that in mind, the hotels opened against a background of compliance and a risk assessment, and that was true of all aspects of the hospitality industry. So we've looked at our businesses, done a risk assessment, and adjusted our standard operating procedures to take that um, into hand. For example, I'm here today, there's a sanitizing unit, there's different areas um, marked out. Um, you're not allowed to queue, you're not supposed to queue, there's sort of an area of two metres um, positioned. Um, I actually stayed in a hotel on um, Sunday evening and I was handed a card with all my details in it, um, an envelope with a sort of how the hotel had worked, um, breakfast buffet was gone, there was no queuing at all, single use lift. The room had actually had an ozone machine put into it um, and that's how they had actually cleaned it. A lot of the things maybe that, you know, those nice magazines and stuff were gone from the bedrooms, but there were two welcome cupcakes, which everybody was very excited about. Um, so it was good to see that kind of hospitality experience. Um, and I think that's what we very much worked on. You know, we will take details. There is accountability and there is some traceability. So if you book a restaurant as the lead person, you would be contacted if anything went wrong. Um, all the staff have been trained on what to do, how to approach people. You know, a very simple one, the pen that you would have got at reception now is a sanitized pen given to you or you use your own pen. Um, but the journey through it is, you know, you actually, in some ways, it's, which is a good thing, you have a sense of security without a sense of intrusion. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and again, I, I what I was going to say is we had a paper from Nilga and Solis yes. that was highlighting the need for um, almost a marketing strategy around that to encourage people to get up, back out and about. Um, and is one, has that been factored into the, the work of the steering? Yes, I think, well? that the, I think that the industry standard were good to go. The fact that it goes overall, I think that 400 people in Northern Ireland, and I understand the majority of those have been actually in the accommodation sector, have signed up for that and have gone through that. And the AA have a similar scheme um, where they have looked at making sure that people are, are COVID compliant and you can go in. We've encouraged people to put those details on their website so that a customer can go in and look at that and make sure that they are happy with those particular measures. Um, I think it is a question that people have asked. There's been a, in a sort of a slight development, there's been a lot more direct bookings with hotels where people have phoned them directly to ask the question. Restaurants have reported a similar thing where people have phone, phoned, may not necessarily have booked on the first phone call, but are very keen to talk to a person and find out what measures are in place. I think once people come inside hospital establishments, 
they're simply there for an evening out to be at a meal or to stay over. I think that they have been very relaxed. Um, certainly when I was away at the weekend, I spoke to a number of people who said they were delighted to be back, very happy to take the measures, but pleased that the actual fabric of the building and the actual experience they have was very good. I suppose the fact that there was a howling wind and it was about nine degrees outside probably helped the whole experience. But in reality, I think people have been quite content and that marketing message has got out there. The fact we have a charter mark that runs throughout the UK is a good thing as well. So it means that people from other destinations nations can see that we've signed up to a very high standard. And Janice, just finally for myself, is there a, an equivalent um, on for the island of Ireland to the We're Good To Go um, mark? In, in the south they have an equivalent um, because of legislation and the way that we're actually structured it was hoped that it could have been a sort of a an, an Ireland north and south that joined together they are very similar and the actual background to them is the same but because of some legislative issues and the way that we're actually structured and the enforcement agencies it was felt that it was it wasn't actually possible to do it so the one we have is signed up to by visit Britain visit Scotland visit England and Northern Ireland tourist board and then the Fulcher one in the south but they are very very similar and the marks look the same and I'm speaking with people who come and travel throughout the island of Ireland they are quite content that the marks are com comparable and don't have any issue with that. Chair, can I just make one point um, on that, please, with regards to the councils? Um, and each of the council areas are also working with their local communities, um, and, and all of them have introduced, um, you know, sort of reassurance um, messaging um, to ensure that, um, you know, everybody feels uh, safe um, and are also welcoming to, to visitors. So there's a lot of work that's gone on to make sure that people feel comfortable um, with regards to the reopening of tourism and hospitality. Thank you. Um, can I bring Gary into the spotlight, please? Chair, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can, Gary. Okay, uh, thanks everyone for uh, your presentations. It's great to see um, the, the hotel industry start to reopen again. I suppose uh, my questions would be to, uh, to Kieran and Eddie, uh, really in terms of your own experiences. Uh, you know, we've heard a bit around how the actual customers feel about the, the changes and about the guidelines. Maybe you could expand just a bit more as to, you know, I'm thinking, care, you know, the Bishop's Gate, uh, famous for the, the great afternoon teas that you do there. Uh, how, how do people feel now about coming into the hotel and when they leave? Is it an enjoyable experience? Gary, thank you for that. We've introduced obviously a lot of safety measures as Janice and Joanne have talked about in general. I mean, we were very lucky at uh, one minute past 12 on Thursday night, we welcomed Simon Calder, the international journalist. So our city in Northern Ireland, and thank you to Tourism Northern Ireland and Tourism Ireland for organizing that. I think getting that message out. We also facilitated a number of journalists over the weekend to stay. And the message and the headlines coming out in all those papers in the Belfast Telegraph and the newsletter has been unfortunately the new normal for hotels is quite normal. So I was delighted to read that headline that the new normal is going to be normal. There is um, a lot of measures to introduce. We've introduced thermal camera at the front door. We've got contract tracing in place. A lot of inquiries. We, we did have a couple of people in for afternoon tea. Food and beverage is very strong over the weekend. Um, and it's great. And it's great to see the city open again um, with other restaurants and things, because that's what we need at the moment. We need everything open. And it'd be great when the tourist attractions open. But I was surprise consumer confidence when they get in um, is very high. They see what we're doing, they see what we're continuing to do, they see that the space that we put in, they see the screening we put in place, they see everything that we're doing in terms of itemizing things and putting things in plastic around the rooms, but very, very positive feedback over the weekend. Okay, Eddie? Um, yeah, similar to ourselves, uh, the guest feedback has been fantastic with the stuff that we've put in place. Um, like the screens at reception, um, the social distancing of tables, the um, extra cleaning and the housekeepers being a bit more visible. Um, normally we try to hide them away, but we've got them front and centre now. Um, of sanitising things, um, we've taken a lot of the stuff that we've been off the tables, like salts and peppers and things, and um, bring them and sanitise them at the table and things like that. But our goal was to be as... Um, unobtrusive as possible to the guest and make it as normal experience that so they didn't have to fear, am I doing something wrong? Um, am I not following rules? 
um, that they come in and we look after it um, as much as possible. Um, and anything they do need direct it, we can bring them and make, make it clear through signage or through our staff. Um, a lot of the feedback over the weekend then was that a lot of their friends were um, unsure about coming out and really they were the test subject, if you like, <laughs> of what, um, what it was going to be like and they were going back to report. Um, so I th think from the feedback we were given that the, it was very successful and ho we're hoping that it continues to build now um, and that those friends now start coming coming out as well and hopefully as it goes along um, we'll see it getting busier. Um, we do have a hotel in the south, it opened on the Monday and we find that that even though there was a lot of excitement about opening the Monday, um, it was quite poor for people coming in but by the Thursday we were, we were um, doing almost by probably 80% of what we would normally do. Um, so it grew during the week um, and certainly this weekend's bookings is looking much better than the previous weekend's bookings. So you hope that trend continues because although this weekend was successful, it wouldn't have been viable to keep it at those levels <laughs> um, for the rest of the year. But um, definitely better than we expected and, and good feedback, which is great. Yeah, I think one of, the, one of the questions we're getting is we're getting a lot of questions. You know, you're talking about afternoon tea, private dinings, communions, christenings, wedding celebrations. A lot of our customers are asking those questions, you know, and, and that's what we need clarity. I know Joanne and, and Janice have referenced it, but we need clarity. It's great to see clarity around small weddings. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of things in our industry been put on hold, family celebrations, whether it be funerals and things like that. So there's a lot of people coming to us and saying, can we have a private funeral for 30, can we have dinner for 20, can we have 10, and uh, it's great that we're getting some clarity around that, you know, but I think we're further ahead than we thought we'd be, you know, somebody had asked me on the 8th of July, um, would I even be trading, I would have said no a month ago, so we're delighted to be there, we're delighted to be trading, but we've got to answer a lot of the questions we're being asked at the moment, we've got to get our full businesses back open, and as Janice says, we're probably 60% of the things that we normally do in a hotel still do open. Okay, thanks for that, and I, I, absolutely, and we will try and do what we can as elected reps to get that clarity for you um, and, and, and work with our executive colleagues. Um, just a final question, um, Joanne had uh, talked uh, about the, the, the work of councils, and you will know, I, I suppose, Kieran, being from the same place that I am, that the, the, the events uh, space is, is very, very important for us. You know, your, your clipper type festivals, your, your Halloween festivals, all of those events are significant and numbers into the city. Uh, not even from whilst we welcome visitors from abroad, but, you know, even on an all island basis, you know, people come for those particular events. What conversations have you had with the council? Are the council, uh, you know, being, being supportive at this minute in time in, in terms of, you know, listening to the concerns of the industry? I think the councillors facing similar challenges as all business. They're trying to obviously get their own uh, house in order. Um, we've had conversations elected on the tourism committee with the council and the city and Strabane council. That's a big challenge for them. I mean, five hotels still remain closed in the city, Gary, and that is based on the fact that they would take the bulk of those bookings, you know, the foil cup. Um, yesterday I was having conversations with the choir festival, which is due to happen in October. It's now going to be virtual. You know, that brought in about £65,000 of room business into the city last October. You know, the Foyle Cup would bring in two or 300000 of rooms business. These are big challenges, and these are why a lot of the big hotels are going to have this challenge to fill. I mean, I have a 30-bedroom property, Shipkey Hotel, other hotels. We're doing okay because we're going to get to 60% occupancy. It's the big hotels that have 150 or the 200 bedrooms that are going to really struggle, and they need those events. But they need clarity around these. And Janice has said it. We need clarity from March. You know, and Luna has said as well, we're not planning a month ahead. In our industry, we're planning nine months ahead. So we need to know that these things are going to happen and whether it's from January onwards. You know, Millennium Forum, I speak to David all the time and he's got a real challenge. You know, he's asking me, will the Christmas pantomime going ahead? And I'm asking him. You know, these are real challenges we need to get to get to soon, but we need to be looking at getting our industry started, particularly around events, sponsors, whether they're outdoor. And I think the council is going to have to rethink a lot of things like Halloween, but we, we need to make sure that we protect these things for 2021 and 2022 as well. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Sinead, moving Sinead into the spotlight, please. There she is. There she is. Good morning. 
Um, good morning and well, thank you very much for your update and Joanne I have to say a, a, a personal thanks to you because you have been constant in giving us updates from the industry uh, almost on a weekly basis and it's really appreciated um, and we know um, how, how much your industry and sector has gone through um, and, and just a, a quick word to Una um, I suppose um, as she said, she's one of the first um, parts of the hospitality sector that closed down almost totally. And, and it's very difficult to kind of see how that they will get up and running to, to the, their full um, in, a, in a full capacity um, in, in the coming weeks and months. But uh, has she got any contingency plans? for um, how, how she may be able to repurpose or, or do something else um, in, in the meantime for her particular uh, business tourism? So for us, Sinead, and, and thanks for that, it, we have looked at hybrid events. So we have one with the Northern Ireland Chamber of Commerce there. Um, and for the Invest in Northern Ireland, we're talking about O'Neill's sports and Cairn. The MD was one of the speakers. Um, for us, we have, we have launched a hybrid event, which gives opportunity for delegates to dial in. Um, what we'd really like is when can we bring delegates in? We have, a, we have a number of clients this year that we've had to postpone. Um, we have ones that are going virtual, um, but it doesn't really, it doesn't pay the rent, to be quite honest. It doesn't make the same amount of money. But from an investment perspective with the International Convention Center, we were brought in to drive economic impact, um, which is bed nights, um, which is restaurants, which is taxis, which then creates the weekend warriors where people come back, they come to a two day conference in Belfast and then they decide to go to the Walls of Derry and North Coast and Fermanagh and come back. Um, so in terms of pivot in our business, we've gone hybrid and we're doing virtual events. And because of the fiber access in Northern Ireland, we have been able to win business um, for conferences that would have been held um, in across the whole of the UK, but we're hosting them virtually because of our tech capabilities within the business. Okay, and the other question then would be really to Janice uh, and possibly Kieran as well there, um, in relation to using our outdoor space in order and, and, and closing down, making the, the, the outside as is this um, more acceptable for actually um, uh, for actual hospitality for for eating and drinking? Have you made progress with that uh, within the local councils uh, and indeed within the various departments that um, are looking at that uh, within uh, the context of the um, assembly and the executive? I mean, speaking um, for speaking for Derry in terms of Derry City Council, they've been very proactive, Sinead, in trying to yeah. get the cafe licenses relaxed. With that comes its own complexity, and you know, particularly us in the hotel sector, we're mindful that we've invested a lot of money in areas you know already uh, in our own premises. We don't want the an open hand approach to it. But I think, um, as Gary alluded to as well, I think councils are going to have to rethink that space. Um, rethink events and rethink the whole purpose of getting people back to, towards the city. And I think they're going to have to use outdoor space more cleverly, although given it's more than Ireland, might have to be covered outdoor space. Mm -hmm. uh, there has been a lot done, that, Sinead. Um, the councils have come together and the Department of Infrastructure, the Department of Justice and the Department of the Economy have all looked at it. Um, there are elements of maybe closing off particular areas and developing hubs, which has pluses and minuses. I mean, it's not without its challenges, not least the weather. Um, mm -hmm. But from our point of view, you know, it is nice to be able to use that outside space at certain times, but you don't actually want to create a, an additional problem. The outside space is nice, and it's nice to that sort of cafe society idea. Um, it can have pluses and minuses at the moment. Um, you can use the outside space if you actually own it. You can also apply for outside space that um, belongs, I think, to the councils and look at that. But you do have to look at licensing with it in relation to the dispensing of alcohol. Um, and certainly within city centres it's something that people can look at but a lot of it really is you know a lot of it really is weather dependent um, the larger events that councils will have and how they use those spaces and how you drive people maybe from that outdoor area into an indoor area that they can use is an important thing very big festivals and places where people congregate close together are going to be a challenge and we've got to find clever ways of creating just as in hotels we've cut touch points People are going to have to look at large matches of 
different ways of doing things. If you're going to have a football match, what way are you going to do that? If you're going to have the Halloween festival, are you going to do it with measured out areas on the walls where it's screened and you do it slightly differently? Um, and th those are challenges and there's no doubt, about, no doubt about it. But for us, just as it is for UNA, events are a very important driver of business. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is an opportune time to actually reimagine our city centres and our town centres. And, and just for example, uh, I mean, I'm very familiar with Cairns premises in, in, um, up in Bishop Street, but also that London Street aspect of it. Uh, I'm looking at Tom McKilty, they're actually closing down places for the weekend only, and they become pedestrianised those we at weekends. And that gives an awful big opportunity for, for businesses to be able to actually get um, you know, more covers, sell more um, at the weekend when it is at its busiest. And I think it's it's important that we, we don't uh, take too long to get the difficulties sorted out because we've got a very short um, summer period here. We need to get these issues sort of out quickly so that uh, our, our space and our outdoor capacity can be maximised. And I do know and I do understand that our weather is not um, the best, but it's not the best in chronic guilty either, and they're, um, they're making it work. I think if you look at somewhere like Kinsale, Sinead, there are real pluses in it and that they have a lot of businesses very close together. There are two things to this. Number one, you know, you have to think of the local retailers and people like that who maybe aren't as happy with this particular development. And it does mean for a council particularly, you have to have parking provision and ways of getting people there. You don't, you know, if you're doing this as a risk assessment, you do not want a bottleneck or a congestion created by you putting in a new pedestrian area. Certainly in Kinsale, where, which is an area I know well, I mean, they have done a very big job on it. Um, mm -hmm. But they have always had a tradition of kind of moving things around and they do have small squares. But you also have to change, look at things like loading, how you get things in and out, how the restaurants and bars actually get their um, food in. I mean, if you do it, if you get very busy, you have to be able to get stuff in. And that's, you know, one of the sides of this that, it's a nice idea doing it. I mean, certain streets in London, for example, I think Rupert Street have done it, have put it in a market. But that market has been fully pedestrianised, but there are other ways of people to get into those businesses. Mm -hmm. And that's something as a, the council would need to look carefully at is, do you create pinch points or do you create areas where you actually end up adding to the issue of risk? And then, as Kieran says, you sometimes dilute the business that you already have by creating another venue, which is something that I think a number of businesses would have concerns about. Well, I'm really talking about outside their own venues yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that they can actually, you know, maybe they need to put infrastructure in place as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and to invest in that infrastructure, you need to make sure that you can use it for a long time and it becomes a regular occurrence that you use your outdoor space. Uh, and it just gives people uh, a wee bit more, I suppose, um, extension of their business whenever they're so confined indoors in relation to the social distancing. Okay, and thank you very much, everybody, for the work that you've been doing. It's uh, it's been amazing, and I've been around the city centre over the, the the past few days, and it's just great to see people out and about uh, and socialising and using their hospitality and and support on local. Janice, am I right that you and Kieran and Eddie have to leave? Yes, we have to go to we have to go to a board meeting. So, um, thank you very much for your time. And um, if you need any further information, we'd be delighted to come back to talk to you again. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Good morning. Thank Good you. luck. Keep all right. Thanks very much. Still got chance Still, uh, today, uh, Good luck. <laughs> So if we if we take Janice, Kieran, Eddie, live footage out of the action. mobile system, if we take Janice <laughs> out of the system, if we take Kieran out of the system, and we we, we continue with Joanna Nuna. Okay. okay. Thank you, Gordon. Well, you got to see the. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks very much. I think most of the points have been made made well. Um, yeah. I'm glad we we can talk about the Greater Belfast area as well. It also exists. Not just the North West know. that we hear so much about. Um, just for the record, it wasn't me who said that. Yes, so <laughs> there are other areas too um, the, uh, where we have large hotels. I think the big issue, is, and it's been fairly well covered, is about public confidence, about using the facilities and feeling safe while they use them. And I think we, more needs to be done to try and get that message out. It was, I suppose, has been covered to some extent, but the public, I don't believe, are aware 
fully of the measures that have been put in place to um, fully sanitise rooms, making giving people a real confidence that things are clean. You wonder who used this room prior to my visit. Type of you know question comes into mind. I think we need uh, more done to reassure the public that when they, they go into use the facilities and stay in an hotel, that everything is safe and sanitised and. Um, I think that's that's important if we're going to try and restore confidence. The other issue is about publicity. I think more needs to be done to try and sell the place locally to obviously to the number one to the people of Northern Ireland to the, the and also the people of Ireland um, that, they, they, that this staycation is is for real it's happening this year and we it's vital that, that we try and restore what is left of the of the summer market, uh, and we try and cash in on it. I'm not sure we're, we're doing that very well at the moment. I just thought about on my own phone. I've got about one, one or two texts from hotels, mainly the multi-chain types, um, about offers that they've on. And people obviously, if they see an offer, they will look at it and, and, and they may go for it. And I think those sort of things need to be exploited. The other point is about weddings. There was uh, an announcement this week about weddings now that numbers can be increased, but it seems to be subject to the size of the hotel. So is it the case the bigger the hotel, the bigger the wedding? Uh, and if you go to a small location, you're going to be very restricted. So just like some clarification on those points. But we do appreciate the work that's been done. It's difficult times for everybody. And reopening is, is, is a slower process, I think, than we all realised. And it's going to take time to build real confidence back into, into our economy. Thanks, I can come in on that, if that's okay. Um, on the um, market, marketing side, um, you're, you're very, you're, you're correct. Um, this is about getting reassurance messages out um, to the public. Uh, and um, one of the uh, things I think we've seen in the customer sent or the consumer sentiment is that people um, are prepared to travel, but they want to hear about people who have done it first. So we need to get the stories out. Um, I think as Kieran was saying that you know people are having a normal experience. Um, so. Um, more people that, that can talk about that. Having the travel journalists over at the weekend was really important. Um, and, and some of the comments back we got was um, they were very nervous about traveling because this was the sort of the first trip um, out of lockdown for them. Um, but they found the whole experience from home to getting to the destination um, and then their, their experience at the destination to be very good. So it's those sort of messages we need to get out. As I said in my um, introduction, it's also important that we have that messaging from the executive as well. And I know work is going on with the executive office and tourism and I with regards to the type of, of reassurance um, messaging that, that we need to hear um, from there. Um, and we also have tourism and I who obviously have launched their local campaign for Northern Ireland and for the Republic of Ireland. So I think there's a lot going on, but we just need people want to hear from other people like themselves. So we need to find a way of sharing those stories. I think on the weddings, um, just to, to clarify that point, um, it is the number, there is no maximum that has been set um, because it will depend on how the venue can manage the social distancing and the guidance. Um, and therefore, you are right, if you have a larger venue, um, you would be able to manage um, a larger number um, in the group, um, ensuring that everybody is social distancing. Um, what that also means to me is that we can start to look at other types of events, um, as Gary was talking about, um, because once you're able to manage a wedding, then we will be able to manage other types of events. Thanks very much. I think the whole thing as well, Chair, event tourism is important. You know, we've had some great major events in Northern Ireland over recent years. I think it's something we need to refocus on, trying to resell this place. It's a great place when people come, as you've said. People come and get the experience. They want to come back and they want to bring their families back. So it's something I think we should keep the focus on and we keep the pressure on within the department on the department, on the minister, that we, we, you know, I think event tourism is a great opportunity for for this place to market it and to bring new people in. And 
it's important that we, we, we work on that in the days ahead. But keep up the good work, and we appreciate all the efforts in, in the hospitality sector. It hasn't been easy, and it will take time to, to rebuild. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Donald Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, and it's good to see uh, the sector opening up again and uh, everybody return to the new normal as such. Uh, I worked in hospitality and hotels and th for the best part of 20 years, um, so I'm very familiar with the sector. Um, and one of the key things, or there's two key things uh, to a successful business in the sector. One is consumer confidence and also uh, retention uh, and confidence of your staff. So quite rightly, we have discussed this morning in terms of how the consumer feels around coming back, or the customer feels coming back into those settings. But in terms of staff, what support has been put in place for the staff? Because if you can't hold on to your staff in, this, in, in that industry, then no matter what you do, you, you can't deliver the service. So what support has been put in to uh, give confidence to the staff and also to retain your staff? Yeah. Um, well, as, as you say, tourism is all about people um, and, you know, Karen and, and Eddie would have talked about how important, um, you know, their staff are to the business. So there has been a lot of training um, of staff to ensure that they are comfortable, that they have the confidence that they're working in a safe environment. Um, there was a lot of guidance that has been provided um, to ensure that, um, you know, the right measures are in place. Um, and, um, you know, and there was in the working safely, obviously, there's been input uh, from the unions as well. Um, they're also from a perspective of keeping um, staff safe, um, a lot of working in, you know, putting teams of people together so that they're they're working with that same team um, all the time. Um, and obviously there are, um, you know, processes and procedures with regards to um, testing, um, you know, um, if, that, if that's required. I think the challenge is being able to bring all of the staff back. Um, there are some, obviously, different rules that have been developed, you know, with regards to ensuring that uh, measures are implemented um, and making sure that visitors are following, you know, social distancing, etc. So, but longer term, there is a real concern, um, depending how the summer season goes, how we support and retain um, staff within the businesses um, over that quiet winter period. And there are discussions ongoing with regards to what sort of um, support and how that would look um, for the industry. Okay, um, and maybe in relation to this question, Uda may have a, have a view on this as well. The Minister surrendered, I think it was £53 million pounds of business support to the centre last, to the executive last month. If you were able to uh, write a cheque for the industry, what would your priority be? What would you want to see support coming from uh, the executive in relation to that funding? What, what would your priority be? But John, it's a, it's a good question. I think for us at the minute, a big piece has to be the safety. Um, and that is making sure that our messaging is correct, but that we're keeping guests and delegates, people that come to Belfast, Northern Ireland, the north of Ireland, um, that they actually feel safe. And I think that's number one in terms of what we have to do. And a lot of that is about perception and confidence and what you would put into your marketing and your message around that. Um, we are in a highly competitive, um, we're on a highly competitive island, we're in a highly competitive industry. Um, and for us, I suppose, from a, a, from a business events perspective, um, we need to be very joined up um, and seeing business events as a driver for economic development. Um, so for me, if I look at the Republic of Ireland, they have got zero VAT that has an impact on us when we're bidding for, we're bidding for national and international conferences. Um, when we look at how we work as a, as a region, um, the North has a, has a great reputation when we get people here. Um, but our challenge is that we're on an island. Um, so air connectivity um, has to be. And then you're looking at if Dublin's a hub, um, if Dublin's actually a hub in terms of the airports um, and people coming up, how do we get the message in? And then how do we make sure that people are coming north um, as opposed to going west and south? Um, but the big piece, and you rightly said it, is the skills and the people development. We in, in tourism, there's, if you were talking to people six months ago, they would have been crying out for staff and we can't get the right people and we don't have enough skills and we, we need 
I suppose, to develop people and, and new people are fighting over talent. So how do we make sure that when the sector bounces back and it will come back, that we don't have a dearth of um, talent leaving it? If I just add to that, I, I think... Um, I worked in IT um, when the dot-com bubble burst um, and a lot of people were, were let go from, um, from the technology um, industry. It took us 10 years to get back to actually having it as an attractive industry. So, um, the, you know, in tourism and hospitality, we are absolutely aware that we need to um, retain those skills and, and also have that proposition to attract people uh, to consider those careers. And I think ultimately that is about ensuring that we have got visitors um, coming in um, to, um, to tourism to stay in our accommodation um, and, and to visit our attractions. So it comes down to the marketing and promotion of Northern Ireland is critical. And we do have to double the investment that we currently um, put into that. Because if we can bring the visitors, the businesses will have the business to retain their staff. And they will also then, we'll have a, an industry that will be attracted that people will be attracted to um, because they can see that there's a future in it. Um, and as um, Una said, absolutely around the air connectivity and having um, air route development funding um, to encourage more um, airlines to consider um, a variety of routes um, into Belfast and Derry. OK, thank you. Thank you, John. John Stewart. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you very much folks so far for the um, presentation and the answers. Most of the issues I was going to raise have been um, highlighted by the other members, especially that around the need for, I think, um, flexible thinking from our councils and from the department regarding street trading and you know using that using that space outside of premises, which I think is vital to create that sort of cafe culture that we really want to see here in Northern Ireland and also to get more people outside given what the restrictions that we have. Um, just in terms of you know what I'd like to see, I totally agree with you, Joanne, about um, promoting staycations. And I think the minister has touched on it, but I'm still not seeing um, a great deal of you know advertising around it from Tourism and I, and uh, in terms of our TV and on adverts and papers to say to people in Northern Ireland, if you're going to spend money getting away this year, do it in Northern Ireland. Stay local. Um, look at the amazing assets we have. Stay in our hotels, you know, and in our guest houses, and try to support the economy that way because I think that will be integral to keeping the sector um, just ticking along until we start to see the growth that we need um, um, to, to get back to. Um, I had another point down. Yeah, in terms of promoting some of the great assets we have as well, events, as Gordon says, are going to be key, and I want to see that the ability for that sector to grow. Also, in terms of our sport tourism, I mean, golf uh, and the hotels and resorts that were benefiting from that in recent years was was on the up. And I think that's something we can still really promote. You know, it's a safe way to do things. You're not getting together in big groups. People who do it are willing to spend a bit of money going through brokers and things to get to here to do that. So I think there's still profits to be made. And I hope there's still going to be a focus on that sort of thing. But I just yeah. want to, I mean, I don't want to add much more. Just take my hat off to yourself and the sector because I think you've gone above and beyond. Even the guidance that's been put out hasn't been great. But I think many providers, hotel and as in tourism and hospitality, have done a Excellent work in going above and beyond to protect staff and customers, but also to get open. And survival is yeah. key. So I wish you the best, and I do hope that we can do all we can to support you. Um, thank you. Just one point on that with regards to, um, as you said, you, you haven't seen very much on the TV with regards to um, tourism and I advertising. Um, I, I think, um, obviously, I know that the um, tourism and I have put a bid into the department for additional funding. Um, the cost of doing that sort of advertising is very high. Mm -hmm. And I think what you'll find the focus is more on social media because it's more organic. You don't have to pay um, for, for that or not, not pay very very much yeah. money for, for that type of promotion. So there is, that's why we're saying the actual investment um, does impact on what you can do. So um, that is something that is, that is really important. Um, on the event side, um, again, I just, and I, just in case it hasn't been made clear, there is a real difference between organized events and mass gatherings. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes they get confused and conflated together. Um, so we're very much talking in the first instance about those events where you you know, people are registering, you can track them, um, uh, and, and, and therefore um, it sort of fits in with the track and trace. Then you have the mass gatherings such as festivals, um, and that's where we really need to think more creatively um, on how to bring those back in a, in a safe way. Yep. No, that's all I have. Thank you very much. 
Um, Joanne and Una, thank you very much for joining us. It has been really useful as always. And just to, to reiterate oh. Dan Aid's <laughs> comments about the, the, uh, <laughs> the briefings that you have continuously provided us with, Joanne, those have been really helpful as well. So look, thank you very much and I'm sure we'll be chatting to you again soon. And we've gone. Thank you. Oh, oh. so I just cut. So I just cut. Well, moving on then to um, item number six on our agenda. We lost we're, no, no, we've still got them. They're still, they're still there. Okay, so matters arising then. Um, at 6.1, there is a response from the uh, the First Ministers at page 38 of your time. On the hardship fund. No, we're all right. Just okay. everyone's fine. So it's to note unless members have any actions that they want to suggest, and obviously we've already covered that at the start of the meeting. Um, okay, so moving on then to 6.2, there is a response from the First Ministers on page 39 on the collaboration between the Executive, Local Council and other stakeholders. So again, it's to note. Um, 6.3, there's a ministerial response at page 41 of your pack on the reopening guidelines. Members, anything we want to suggest or content to note? Okay. Um, Six point four. Then um, ministerial response, page forty three of your pack on the um, the issues raised by the union for supported employment. So members, to note, content to note that. Great. Um, departmental briefing then on page forty five on rebuilding a stronger economy. Um, members, content to note. Yep. Um, departmental response then at page 57 of your pack on the haulage industry. And obviously that was covered yesterday in the assembly debate as well. Um, then at page um, 59 of your pack, there's a departmental response um, on the um, report from the Derry Chamber of Commerce. Members content to note. Great. Um, then at page... Um, 61 of your pack, the department has sent a correction on a figure omitted from the statutory rule on the education support, student support amendment regulations for Ireland 2020. Um, and I think we're getting something further on that, aren't we? Yes. They have to come back to it. Right. So members can tend to note for now. Great. So 6.9 then, there's correspondence from the Committee for Finance at page 63 of your packs on the SL1, the rates coronavirus emergency relief number two regulations NI 2020. Members content to note. Chair, sure, yeah, I just would welcome that. And I think um, we were in our office, we had an inquiry yesterday. There's still no specific list though um, on on the uh, of the various businesses that will be entitled to this rates relief. That's still vague and, and uh, I suppose, somewhat open to interpretation. So this ASL one hasn't gone through yet, has it? No, the, the chair of the committee has, a, has signed off on it. Um, we had put the input into them about the specifics yeah. uh, around the issues that you particularly, Mr Dunn, had identified. The officials yeah. said, yes, those areas would be covered. And um, the finance committee has signed off on it on that basis. Therefore, when the SR comes back, that's largely it. it. It's a case of the SR itself can't be amended when it gets to SL5 stage. So that committee has accepted that, feeling reassured by the officials that the areas that this committee had highlighted would be covered. Um, I'm not sure the time scale for the SR coming. I don't know if that committee's meeting again, so it may be that they won't deal with that SR again. I'll pursue that and see just exactly what that time scale is. Okay, no, I think it's important that people get clarification on as the time goes on too, you know, into the year, businesses want to know why the rates have to be paid or not. So I think the matter should be pursued and hopefully got to a conclusion. So thanks, Chair. Thanks, Gordon. Um, so moving on then to 6.9, there is a response from um, Penny Morton, MP, the Paymaster General, at page 65 on the transition period. Um, the committee agreed last at last week's meeting to read to sorry to write to the Secretary of State seeking an update on the meeting and future plans. So the, with the letter was also copied to the minister. So content to know for now. Mm -hmm. yeah, anything further? 
Um, then 6.11 at page 66 of your pack, there's correspondence from the National Lottery Fund on dormant account funding. Um, we sought clarification last week on the operation of the dormant account scheme here. Um, as it operates differently than in Britain, so are members content to know? Sorry, Chair, Gary is saying there's no volume. Is that still? Yeah, I, we're, we're trying to work on that. We we can we can hear them. They can't hear us. Okay. We're trying to work out why that's happening, and it looks like they're being moved back into audience and then put back again yeah. in the spotlight. I think it's it's just a little technical glitch, right. but we we are trying to sort that out. Is it anything to do with the internet? See, it's not the best now. either. I'm just wondering if anything to do with that. Anybody having that nice problem with the internet? Internet has been dire. coming and going. I know. Yeah. I've had to back into the There's thing. Yeah. Can, you, can you see and hear us now, Gary and Sinead? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. I think we, we must. We don't want you to miss out. We've had a surge in our broadband or something. I'm not. Just in case you weren't talking about dairy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Please help. But, Chair, it might just be worth flagging up on the dormant accounts um, part of the. The um, paper that's in the pack there highlights that the, the funding controlled here through the Department of Finance is um, put towards projects in the third sector. So it is very, very tailored to here. Um, different things happen in GB, but this is very specific about funding um, social enterprises and so on, um, which I guess in, in these particular times is very, very welcome. And I fear we may have lost. Again. Again. We we keep on going, Chair. Mm. Okay. Um, so are we content then to move on to yep. six twelve? Um, we have correspondence from an individual at page sixty eight of your pack on the Presbyterian Mutual Society responding to the department's previous comments on the matter. The uh, our members consent that we thank the individual for the information provided to the committee in the correspondence and acknowledge as the individual states in the correspondence that it, it was a traumatic event for thousands of people at that time. The individual is not asking for a further response from the department or the committee. However, we should probably send it on to the department as well. Agreed. Thank, thank you. you. Right, thank you. Then page 32 of your table papers, there is a departmental response on postgraduate funding. Are our members content to forward it to the correspondent who wrote to us about it? And we will continue to, to um, with the department. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then um, 6.14, there is a copy of a Solus briefing paper at page 33 of your table papers. Are our members content to note for now? Great. Um, then there is a letter sent to us at page 44 of your table papers by, sorry, letter sent to the Minister for Communities. It's another one from the committees, Communities Committee. To which minister? It's gone, to, go it's gone to the Economy they, Minister, sorry. They have also forwarded us other correspondence as well, have they? Yeah, that's yes. the second set. Yeah, so there is a copy of a letter forward to the Economy Minister by the Communities Committee on rate. Guarantee your members content to note that. Great. Um, so then there's a response at page 47 of your table papers from the Financial Conduct Authority um, on our communication around business insurance um, and the process that they are currently going through. So our members content to note that. Great. Okay. So item number seven and the SL1 from the CITB and I Levy Order 2020. There is a clerk's memo at page 71 of your pack. Um, and then there is the SL1 at page 72 of your pack. Um, this statutory rule will enable CITBNI to raise funds to support the training of those employed or intending to be employed in the construction industry um, and is subject to neg negative resolution and is anticipated to come into operation on the 31st of August 2020. This is an annual SR that happens. Um, so the committee, this is the committee's opportunity to consider the policy set out in the SL1 and it's not possible to amend this once the rule has been made and laid out in the Assembly Business Office, so are members content with the policy implications of the proposed legislation. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Moving on then to item number eight, there is a departmental consultation priority dispatch provisions of the 2019 Electricity Recast Regulations EU 2019-943. Um, there is a departmental paper at page 75 and the consultation paper to be published on the 15th of July at page 79. Um, after that the consultation will close in September and an SR will follow then. 
Um, are members content to receive a res summary of responses after the consultation is closed? Great. Right. Okay. Um, item number nine then, the Northern Ireland Authority for Utility Regulation Annual Report 2019-20. Um, refer members to the copy of the Utility Regulators Annual Report for 2019-2020 at page 102. Are members content or are there any actions that you would like to suggest? There is hope that we will have a briefing from the utility regulator in the autumn. Great, yeah, that's good. Okay, okay so moving on then to item number 10, correspondence. 10.1, um, there is a copy of correspondence from the Committee for Finance at page 144 on the review of arm's length bodies um, from NDNA. Um, are members content to write to the Minister to indicate the Committee is aware of the review and will seek a briefing from the Department to ensure members play an appropriate role in that process? Yep. Great. Okay, moving on then to 10.2, the correspondence from Nilga and Solis at page 147 from a joint policy paper on transformation policy guidance for renewing urban and rural centres post-COVID. Are members content to note that for now? Welcome back to yes. further Great. in relation to that. Thank you. Okay. 10.3, this correspondence from Coffee Conjo, I hope that's pronounced right, uh, as with local coffee shop, um, page 159, regarding access to the hardship funds. And obviously, this is something that we need to raise, so we're happy to forward that to the department for an urgent response. Chair, just if it's worth noting, they, they sp I spoke to um, a manager from Transact, and apparently this is a problem across a lot of their sites. Okay where the the small kiosks don't pay rates it's part of their renting and they've fallen um you know through the, the system of supports and in this case they have more than one premise so they also don't get any support for that so it, it seems like you're talking quite a lot of businesses here and it is specific to what's going on in stations bus centers and so on so uh, i think there's a level of urgency there as yeah. well so if members are yes. content to I think it extends further. If you take all the um, residents of yeah. St George's Market, for example, who don't pay any rates, they have been there stalwarts of that location for years. Any market traders don't have any actual rate overheads, so didn't qualify. Fell through the gaps, especially if they're not employing anyone. So we press. Great, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ten point four. Then there is a position paper from London Dairy Chamber of Commerce, at page one hundred and sixty-one, regarding procurement of PPE, and obviously we've discuss that in some length this morning as well with Invest. So are we content to forward that paper to the department? Yep. Right. Okay, 10.5. Yeah, sorry, go ahead, Gary. Chair, I, I would also ask that that be forwarded to the Finance Minister as well. On then to 10.5, with correspondence from Jerry Carl, MLA, at page 50 of Table Papers on the imminent launch of his trade union freedom bill um, and a survey in relation to that. Yeah, so, we have no more detail on that, Chair. Okay. So, um, just to note that for now. Um, 10.6 yeah. then, there is a copy of the 15th report of the examiner of statutory rules at page 51 of Table Papers. Are members content to note? Mm. Yeah. Um, 10.7 then, um, there is a copy of the Institute of Chartered Accountant in England and Wales annual report at page 59. Are members content to note? Good. I meant 59 of table papers. Um, 10.8, there's correspondence from an individual um, inquiring about the NIRHI scheme at page 88 of table papers. Um, are members content to send that on to the department for an urgent status report on the scheme? Great, yeah. 10.9. Sorry. I wonder can we um, require or request an update on um, the, the current status of the scheme? Because I've had a few inquiries over the, the past uh, few weeks in relation to this. And in many ways, um, a lot of farmers, for example, are under a lot of pressure uh, as a result of COVID and uh, the, the, the outstanding issues of RHI so also causing them uh, distress. So it would be good to get an update. We'll, we'll do that. On what, sorry, Chair? Uh, just RHI. What's going on with the, the scheme? The oh, I'm sorry, right, uh, yeah, that's that right. Thank you. Situation. Okay, so moving on to 10.9, a um, copy of correspondence from Belfast International Airport to the Chancellor on the introduction of arrivals duty free stores once the transition period ends. Are members content to note? Great. 
10.10 then is correspondence page 91 of table papers from um, NI Renewables Industry Group on the Energy Strategy. Um, our members consent to forward that on to the department um, and convey the committee support for, for the sentiments of what the letter says in regards to the time scales of the strategy. Yep. Okay then, that brings us to any other business? No? Okay. Um, date, time and place of the next meeting then is next Wednesday morning here in room 30 at 10 a.m. Chair, sure, yeah, we're, we're going to do um, we have a briefing from academics and the EU, and um, we're also going to do a bit of forward planning. We have a little bit more information now about our quantum and time scales for secondary legislation on EU exit. Um, so it's just to give members an understanding of how that's going to develop over the summer and into the autumn. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.